So um, we are here still on our bioinformatics page and we've all been through our various courses, intro to R, some introduction to genomics data, the types of data we're going to be handling in high throughput sequencing data, short read data. We've really come to the end and we've applied this to things like ChimpSeq, RNA-seq, um, and ATT-seq. And later on, we're going to be looking at some single cell. But today we're really excited because we're here, Genome Assembly, which the BRC really knows nothing about. But we are very lucky to have um, Julio and Olivier coming to us from the Jarvis Lab and then the BGL, RGL, um, respectively. Olivier, who is um, director of the RGL, and I believe the BGL, um, he's joined us around the same time and he brings a new technology, it's around the same time as the BRC, and he brought a new technology to Rockefeller, a whole new set of skills, um, pack bio, long reads, and genome assembly. Um, and they've been doing some really fantastic work there. So I really wanted to just uh, say thank you for coming and uh, joining us in the BRC for doing these training. I, it looks amazing and I'm really excited to see this myself. So I'm gonna hand over to Olivier um, to take this away. So Julio, you're starting? Sure. So, well, thank you everyone for being here. Um, so, actually we're, we're going to talk about genome assembly, which is a very uh, specific topic uh, in, in genomics. I uh, hope by the end of this uh, short uh, course and introduction, you will actually know what exactly we mean by that. First of all, uh, I, I mean, we already been introduced by, by Tom. Uh, I'm a host of here at the Rockefeller. Uh, Olivier is the head of the Vertebrate Genome Laboratory, and he will tell you uh, in a moment a bit more about what the Vertebrate Genome Laboratory is uh, and uh, and what we do uh, together. By the way, I'm also part of the Vertebrate Genome Laboratory. I consider myself a member of both, uh, as you can see here, uh, in labs, essentially. So where does this all come from? Just to, uh, to give you an idea, we work on this uh, uh, project uh, called the Vertebrate Genomes Project. It's um, an international uh, project involving three main uh, partners, institutions, uh, but actually many more uh, as well that contributes uh, to a lesser or greater degree. Uh, the, the, the Rockefeller is a partner uh, with the, B, the BGL. Uh, then there is the Wellcome Trust uh, Sanger Institute in the UK and the Max Planck Institute in Dresden. These are the train, three main uh, hubs, let's say, that generate the data for our project, but again, there are many uh, uh, hundreds of people involved. And the goal of this is, uh, well, the ultimate goal is to uh, basically provide uh, reference resources for all uh, species of vertebrates. Uh, we have estimated about 66,000 species, um, maybe more, probably more, but that's a rough estimate. Uh, and of course, I mean, uh, we're not uh, anywhere close to that. We are actually in our phase one we're trying to complete, uh, we're getting close to that, we're trying to complete uh, uh, one reference for each order of vertebrates. So we're talking about about 200 species, okay? Um, these kind of efforts are actually, I mean, we're not alone. There are other efforts like this. Uh, now that essentially it's possible, it has become more and more uh, affordable to generate reference genomes of high quality. Of course, if you, go back in history that was not possible uh, and uh, for it basically became possible uh, very recently. And now all these initiatives are trying to, you know, um, contribute to this uh, global effort uh, that has a lot of implications for uh, biodiversity preservation, for, for um, you know, uh, biological uh, questions and so forth. But here is a bunch of examples. We have uh, some projects that are focused on specific taxa like the Burton K, uh, which you know, it's very close to the the, the vertebrate genomes project, of course, the bar one K, but they have let's say more a uh, bit of a focus. Or we have a regional or let's say national initiatives like the Darwin Tree of Life in the UK. Uh, we have a, a, 
a large initiative in Europe trying to federate all these projects at the European level, which is called European Reference Genome Atlas. Uh, we have uh, you know, another large group that is focused specifically on invertebrates. So if you want our current counterpart, and all these projects tend to now go under this a, a relatively new umbrella of Earth Biogenome Project, uh, which is not sequencing or assembling genomes per se, but it's like a coordinating network uh, across the globe. So why is it so important to uh, generate reference genomes? Uh, oftentimes, I think that the, the availability of reference genomes, at least if there is one already for the species that you are actually uh, studying, it's uh, taken as granted by many. Um, if you're studying, I don't know, humans, well, for sure, man, that goes uh, 20 years back now, uh, mouse, uh, you know, you design your probes, you design your experiments using uh, the reference that is already available. But if you're actually working on something that is a bit more exotic, uh, so basically any non-model species, uh, that's uh, that's a problem because, of course, you don't have uh, any information about or have li limited information about uh, the genome of the species uh, that you're trying to, uh, to study. Uh, so that's why, I mean, uh, there has been a lot of... Um, uh, let's say, um, publicity also to, to this particular effort. So you see the axial genome, a big genome. Uh, primates, of course, are very important. And maybe one could think if we don't have a, you know, a clear overview of how many reference genomes are out there, that there are already many of them. But actually, it's really a tiny fraction uh, of the whole biodiversity. So uh, we're talking about, I don't know, I would say 500, 1,000 genomes that are out there of reference quality. And even when we're talking about the reference genomes, we're talking about things that are, have a very different quality, OK? Uh, so as uh, Sanger put it a uh, um, long time ago now, knowledge of sequence, of course, it's going to help us in the end to understand the living matters. And the, the starting point for any genomic studies is definitely a reference. Uh, genome. It, you, you cannot stop there, but it's it's a, it's the really starting point. So, going a bit back uh, in time, uh, well, let's forget about let's say uh, two centuries ago, but uh, or even after the, the DNA was first you know, the, uh, described. But um, uh, we can distinguish at least three uh, main events in terms of technology development. And now we are in this uh, so-called, or at least by some, uh, defined as third generation uh, era of, of, of sequencing, uh, which allows really to generate reference quality uh, genomes, uh, genome assemblies for many, many species at scale. We're not there yet in that all, even these efforts, as we said, the VGP is in its first phase, and it's actually pretty advanced compared to other projects. So, we are, we, we are really uh, seeing the beginning of this effort at the global level, but we're not there. And this was allowed by the um, uh, basically the introduction of a few key technologies, uh, which again, go under the umbrella uh, of third generation. With third generation, of course, we're talking about the, the Sanger uh, sequencing, which of course was instrumental for, for the, let's say the Human Genome Project and other projects uh, 20 years ago now. Uh, but of course, now it's uh, definitely not something you can use for for even for small genomes. Uh, and of course, Illumina. Illumina uh, for the last mm, 10, 15 years was main technology, but we will see that Illumina sequencing has a lot of drawbacks when it comes to um, uh, assembling reference genomes. So that's why the third generation sequencing technologies are actually so, uh, so helpful. Here. So, just, uh, I said I will skip the, the let's say, um, history, but here it is just to define what the problem is. So when we're talking about assembling a genome, we're talking about a very uh, simple problem in principle, and it's a problem that was uh, um, essentially already uh, solved, if you want, a long time ago by, by Sanger uh, himself. So in 1953, Sanger, of course, is well known for having uh, invented Sanger sequencing with uh, uh, the deoxynucleotide and, and, uh, and so forth. But actually, it is uh, also the uh, first one with the, the um, sequence, the first uh, protein. And that was actually before uh, the, the DNA was sequenced. So uh, that was the, the insulin. And he also, basically invented the idea of the genome assembly because 
the idea here is that you chop whatever, uh, you know, um, in this case, a protein, but whatever uh, sequence of uh, amino acids or nucleotides you have into smaller pieces, and then you use the smaller pieces and their overlaps to reconstruct the original uh, sequence. Okay, so this was already well established. Of course, the, there were many algorithm developments, but the, it was already well established as a principle seven years ago. And then in the 70s or uh, late 70s, this was more uh, say formalized uh, by uh, Roger Staden, uh, which I would say invented the first DNA sequencing software. So uh, of course, I mean, in the 80s, it's um, already, you know, we're getting to the computers, we're getting into uh, a different uh, ballpark. And uh, uh, the idea, okay, it was we can, you know, shotgun uh, fragment uh, all the, the genome of, of something, and then we can use the overlaps uh, to reconstruct uh, the original sequence. And Sanger himself used this approach, the shotgun sequencing approach. Again, usually, I mean, I, I before I actually deep it, uh, in, uh, dive deep into this, I used to think that shotgun sequencing was something introduced uh, in the late 90s, but actually it's not. It's something that goes way um, uh, back in time. And it was used by Sanger himself in 1982 to assemble the Lambda phage. Now, the lambda phage, it's a, it's a very popular uh, um, bacteriophage, uh, especially when you're uh, a genomicist, because uh, I don't know if you know, but like the, it's used also for Illumina uh, sequencing uh, as a control. Uh, anyway, so the, these uh, principles uh, have a long history. And of course, today they have been refined to the scale that you can actually assemble entire genomes uh, from scratch. So not 40,000, uh, 48,000 base pair, but uh, gigabases of, of, the, of, uh, of genome size. Uh, so you see that there is a, a quite a steep curve in terms of um, after you know, these breakthroughs, what uh, was possible. We start from very, very small uh, DNA sequences that we cannot even call them assemblies, or we're talking about hundreds base pair uh, in the beginning and then we progressively see that there is a, you know, a, that larger and larger genomes uh, become accessible uh, to, uh, to genome assembly. Uh, we have some phages, as you can see, through the 70s. And then in the 90s, we start to see more complex genomes uh, coming together. And again, here we have to um, avoid the impression that, let's say, these genome assemblies are necessarily complete or very accurate. We can do better today with the technologies, but at least they were uh, good enough to answer many biological uh, questions. Uh, of course, then the, the, the hallmark of all this is the uh, 20, 20, uh, 2020, uh, sorry, the, um, um, the end of the millennium where the human genome uh, is released, at least a draft of the human genome. Uh, but also the, the, uh, there is the mouse genome, the, 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 the fly genome, uh, and so forth. Then what comes um, in terms of, uh, uh, well, this slide actually, it's about the, the human genome. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with this, uh, but this is to describe the two main approaches that were actually, uh, with, with this history, uh, the two main approaches that were actually applied to assemble the human genome. Uh, I don't know if you're aware again, but there was a, a quite intense competition between two groups. One was uh, uh, led by um, essentially the, the, the NIH, uh, it was uh, the Public Human Genome Project, and there was a, another project led by Craig Venter, uh, initially actually worked for the, human genome pro the Public Human Genome Project, but then uh, decided that um, from a scientific standpoint, maybe also from a political standpoint, that they could actually do better or at least uh, uh, get uh, uh, faster to a, uh, a, a final assembly and decided to go together. That there is a great book from, from Craig Venter about this, if you're interested. Uh, my Genome, My Life, where he recalls the entire uh, process, the, 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 um, the fact that he was able to raise millions of dollars in, in months uh, for this. Um, and so, that there was a very, I mean, a scientific disagreement between these two groups because in one case, the um, public project was actually using the hierarchical shotgun sequencing approach, where basically the idea is that you take 
these back clones. So you have uh, these uh, artificial chromosomes that uh, uh, are um, that some uh, bacteria can actually harbor, and, and you have very big chunks of DNA in each of one of these, and you sequence those independently. Uh, and this is actually a way to reduce the complexity of the problem of genome assembly, because if you have a human genome of three gigabase pairs, and of course, there is a lot of uh, repetition, or there are a lot of repeats uh, scattered across the genome, a lot of regions that look very similar. If you try to find the overlap between them, it's actually very, very challenging. So what uh, the idea was, and of course, was already successfully applied before that, was, okay, let's divide the big problem into smaller problems. That's, of course, a very um, pretty much established scientific approach uh, to problem solving. And, and once we have that, the smaller problems, we solve them independently, and then we finally uh, find the overlaps that reconstruct and solve the, the, the bigger problem. But of course, this is much more laborious than the alternative, uh, which uh, is, uh, again, using uh, uh, whole uh, genome shotgun sequencing directly, so without having to uh, uh, have a, any back, back clone uh, intermediate. Uh, the problem is that this approach, uh, most of, of the scientists at the time did not believe it could work for such a complex genome as the human genome. Uh, Le, uh, Venter did not think of, uh, that was the case. He uh, basically filled an entire building of uh, uh, Sanger sequencers. Uh, and uh, generate only uh, short fragments for, for the assembly. Um, and uh, well, the, the interesting uh, side of this story is that let's, the, the, the public, public human genome project was right in that the, the quality of the genome that you could generate from the hierarchical shotgun sequencing approach was much better than the one from a shotgun sequencing approach only. Uh, so ultimately, people have uh, been using the, the public uh, genome assembly for their analysis, as is also the one that has been maintained over the years. But on the other hand, uh, they were wrong in that the uh, whole genome sequencing, uh, sorry, whole genome shotgun sequencing approach was actually the one that would have been successful in the end, so that people started to adopt. And all these uh, uh, projects that we you know, are going to discuss today are actually based on whole genome shotgun sequencing and there is no more a need for intermediates that are uh, um, laborious and of course also have a lot of other uh, downsides. So of course, let's say behind the scene we have all this, um, uh, uh, let's say historical background, there is a always the fact that the technology and the cost of the sequencing, of course, it's in uh, going down dramatically, you know, there is always this comparison with the Moore law about uh, the, the, the cost or the, the efficiency of compute that is going down, uh, but actually the cost of sequencing goes uh, down much faster than that. Uh, and along with that came a lot of uh, new technologies, as, as I mentioned before. Uh, instrumental uh, after the Human Genome Project was the, the fact that the NIH started to grant a lot of uh, uh, money for uh, uh, new sequencing technologies that could help, uh, you know, improve this uh, kind of um, uh, problem and the, and the quality of the data. So uh, again, this is really uh, uh, essential and led in the years after the years 2000 to a lot of other genomes of uh, comparable size and, and challenge as much as the human genome to be assembled, sequenced, at a much lower cost now because the human genome project costed, uh, I think it was three billion, uh, and of course uh, the these other projects were of course still expensive but uh, much cheaper. So we have mouse, we have the uh, mosquito, rice, dog, rat, chimpanzee, uh, and um, and so after after these, as as you can see here. The, Scientists all, uh, all over the world started to join forces, creating these um, consortia that could potentially uh, open also the uh, new model species, uh, uh, make them accessible uh, to sequencing. So the Genome 10K is the uh, basically the, the council that uh, uh, promoted the, the creation of the Vertebrate Genomes Project, for instance, uh, and uh, and uh, and this is where we are now. Okay. Into the, around to the 2010, we start to see also these new technologies arising, the long-read so-called technologies of the uh, 
uh, nanopore uh, reads and the uh, pack bio reads we're going to talk extensively about in a moment. Um, and so these really open uh, new ways of, of assembling these genomes so that today these are actually the only technologies that are really relevant uh, for this problem. Uh, just to give you an idea, if you go on GeneBank, and uh, this is probably not uh, really up to date, but um, I look at, the, let's say in this case, uh, mammals and vertebrates, sorry, not vertebrates in general, and you look at the what's available, as I mentioned, one could be tempted, I think, to think that there are many more genomes out there than we could think of, but actually that's not quite the case. We're talking about a few hun hundreds of them, no more than that. And again, the quality is really, really different. And also, if you look into the size of these genomes, actually, you, you see that most of them are actually relatively small, despite the fact that even in vertebrates, there are many genomes that are actually really, really big, even 100 uh, gigabases uh, of genomes. The problem here is that, of course, even with the technology that we have today, uh, the, the quality of the assemblies that we could generate and the cost of generating these assemblies is exceeding the, uh, let's say, the, the, the motivation to actually do them. So they, that's why we're not, we don't have these genes. We don't know about the variability, the variation uh, that these species have. And that's why we try to fill these gaps with this um, uh, consortia. Uh, of course, uh, again, in GeneBank, you have also very uh, small genomes. Today, assembling small genomes is a trivial uh, thing to do. There is no really, um, mathematical complexity at this point so that you can have a very uh, I mean a variety of uh, uh, prokaryotes assemble even small genome of eukaryotes assemble in in minutes and the quality of these uh, assemblies is actually way better than the original assemblies uh, for the same species uh, of course I mean all of this is done to uh, with the ultimate goal of studying these genomes, using this information to understand something about the biology of the, uh, the species. So um, here is an example from, from our lab. Uh, uh, this is from 2014, but actually in April, uh, we have a, a very big uh, special issue in, in nature uh, coming out with uh, several studies and, uh, and many more uh, high quality genomes being released. Uh, and uh, of course, we're planning to use these genomes to understand biology and understand evolution and so forth. So, of course, uh, one can think of using them to reconstruct a, a, a phylogeny of birds, uh, which has been uh, always a challenge because of the um, our soul of early branches uh, in birds. But of course, there are millions of other applications you can think of. Uh, and all of them usually have uh, some alignment uh, problem underlying. With this uh, introduction, I will, uh, well, first of all, I don't know if you have questions. That's uh, probably, I don't know, actually, we're not, uh, we're not too many. So I think it, it would be nice if this becomes uh, somewhat interactive. I don't know what the, the organizer thinks about, think about this, but I think it would be nice. So if you uh, want to step in, or again, if you have questions right now about this part, do you? If not, okay, so I will uh, give the word to uh, Olivier, uh, who is going to give us an overview of, of the technologies that are involved uh, in genome assembly uh, today. And we can discuss this together. Uh, thanks, Giulio. Um, so as Giulio mentioned, um, we're going to, to focus on this section to uh, describe technical backgrounds of um, sequencing technology. Um, we feel that it's very important to understand the chemistry that is behind this and the limitations and biases in order to really be able to assemble genome in, in a smart way. Um, so, okay, maybe I should share my slides. Do you want to do that, Julia? Sure. I need to stop sharing. All right. I'm not sure what you see here. Do you see a full screen? Oh, 
almost full screen, but you, you're still sharing the same slides uh, I was showing. So I don't know if. Um, yeah, next one. Yeah. All right. So, as Julio mentioned earlier, um, sequencing te technology, I've been following the Moore's law for a bit, uh, meaning that every, um, every two years, you half. You you uh, alving, uh, you divide by two the, the amount of um, the, the cost of sequencing. Um, this was mainly driven by next gen sequencing more recently. Uh, so now we can go even faster than Moore's law. Um, you can sequence human genome for less than one one thousand dollars, and this is partic particularly um, due to Illumina technology. So Illumina is a short read uh, technology about 150 base pair sequences. Um, so the decrease in cost and the increase in throughput has been spectacular with them. Um, but somehow, as you mentioned earlier uh, as well, hit a technical limitation for genome assembly. Um, specifically, the, the most common challenge in genome assembly is the presence of repeats. So for example, in human, in human telomere repeats, TTA, GGG, um, are 5 KB to 12 KB long. Right, uh, mini satellites at 200 base pairs to so several KBs. Um, long interdispersed repeats are about one to seven KB, but there is hundred thousand of them. Um, so you can imagine if you read or your sequences are shorter than repeats, then it's a problem, right? So what happens when you do a genome assembly with shorter reads and repeats is that the repeats tends to cluster together and collapse into one small uh, sequence. Um, and you and in consequence, you get a very fragmented genome. So obviously, Illumina reads are too short to reads of content that are bigger, uh, to reads of repeats that are bigger than the base pairs. We need longer reads. So if you want to have a very continuous genome, longer reads is necessary. Oops. So an example of longer reads is packed biotechnology. So here is a comparison of um, uh, Illumina on the left panel and packed by on the right panel. So there are differences. First, th th there is a read length difference. Illumina, as I was saying earlier, is about 150 base pair long, and packed by will be long, very long sequences, uh, about 50 KB long. Um, interestingly, the throughput is very different. Um, Illumina, Illumina has much higher throughput than packed by for instance, the Illumina Novasik S4 flow cell can generate about 20 billion read pairs in 40 hours. In contrast, packed bio will, will generate much lower throughput, about, um, about 100 gigs or, um, or 5 million reads every 30 hours. So uh, obviously, there was a big difference. Um, the other difference is the quality. And uh, so Illumina sequencing is well known for the very high quality. We're talking about uh, about 1% error rate, um, while in contrast, um, packed bio quality is much lower historically. 15% um, error rate, meaning that every 100 base pairs, we have 15 errors. Um, most of these errors are in the apps. Uh, this has changed recently, but I will go back to it in, in a bit. Um, Add actually that the fact that they are in Dells, it's it's relevant because it's even worse than if they were you know just snips uh, all over the place. It's a uh, yeah, it's a big, big issue for alignment. Yeah. Um, one important thing that people usually um, underestimate is the amplification process. So Illumina has an amplification process. Not only when you make a library and you amplify your library, but also just before sequencing, they call it clustering. So essentially, um, a library is a single, is a small molecule, and the camera cannot really uh, take picture or, or, or record the sequencing process of one single molecule on, on an Illumina flow cell. Um, so it needs to amplify the signal somehow. So there is this bridging amplification uh, on the left panel. You can see that. So the 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 Illumina substrate is a piece of glass. I don't know if you see my video here. This is the Illumina flow cell. It's a piece of glass covered with billions of oligos, oligonucleotides. These oligonucleotides are um, 
can hybridize to a library adapter. So your library fragment is going to ligate, you're going to hybridize onto the flow cell through these oligos. And then you start the amplific bridging amplification. Um, so the library will bank, create a bridge. On the three prime end here, you see on, on, the, on the red part, will connect and keep moving like that in the neighboring oligo. And you create this clonal cluster. Then second thing happens, um, you have a polymerase incorporating, synthesizes the, the second strand of the DNA. Um, and you have a bunch of nucleotides of different colors. And you take pictures. So every time a nucleotide is incorporated, sequencing stops, you take a picture, analyze the color, analyze the color with different filters, and proceed on the next base. So you're doing cycles. Uh, PacBio is very different. PacBio has no amplification at all. Um, it's a single molecule technology. So the PacBio chip has much fewer spots. Um, it has about 8 million wells on the chip. The chip is called smart cell. Um, I will show more later. This is a smart cell. This is very small, you can see. Um, each well is big enough to, um, to have one molecule bound onto a polymerase. So now I'm going to explain more in details, but each, um, each well would generate only one sequence from one molecule. So the, the advantage of having no amplification, you have no biases. So for example, um, uh, the main PCR amplification bias is GC. Um, so Illumina is well known to have this GC bias, which is sequences with very high GC and sequences with very low GCs are going to be underrepresented compared to uh, the one with an average GC. But you don't see this type of, um, of bias with uh, bio. Oops. So the PacBio sequencer here is called a SQL2. Um, that's recent, relatively new. Uh, SQL 1 um, came in 2016 and SQL 2 just came last year. Um, the throughput is much higher, but not as Illumina. So how does it work? Um, so essentially you have three components of the, for sequencing on PacBio. You have a polymerase. You have a DNA template that is made into a library. The library will have a binding site for a primer that the polymerase is going to bound on that and start sequencing on this single molecule, right? And you have a bunch of um, nucleotides with a dye. So in each well, you're going to have one polymerase is going to be covalently bound in the bottom of the well, you can see here, and the DNA and, and a piece of DNA, and you start sequencing. Um, it's done differently from PacBio because, it, other than Illumina, because PacBio doesn't have cycles. So essentially you sequence, you're going to sequence at the speed of the polymerase. So you're taking movies. Um, so what happened is you have all these dyed nucleotide floating around at pretty high speed. Your camera doesn't see it, right? But as soon as this nucleotide is, that is incorporated by the polymerase into the sequence, it kind of pose the nucleotide for a small amount of time that is enough to be visible on the camera. And then clear the dye and keep going like that. Um, so a, a laser is beaming onto the flow cell and the color that refracts to, from the well indicates what base it is. So essentially the, the major um, advancement from PacBio wasn't, wasn't the library, it wasn't sequencing reagents, it was this well. Um, this well is called zero mode wavelength. Uh, well, or ZMW, uh, has a very interesting property. It has a very high refraction index. I mean that one nucleotide will be very visible in this well. We will really, the, the refraction will be kind of intense, but limited to the well. Right. So this is what packed bio alignment looks like. So I don't know if you're familiar with IGV, um, uh, plots. Um, this is aligned to um, to a uh, to a zebrafish genome. Um, each of these rows is a packed bio sequence. Um, well, uh, maybe actually, that's a good question. I mean, how much are people familiar with this plot? Are you, Tom, and you know, the community more? Is it something that 
I guess everyone is familiar with the plot. We, we showed people how to visualize BAMs like this in uh, IGV. So hopefully they remember. All right. But maybe, maybe with less density than this. They're nice short Illumina reads. Illumina reads will look much, much cleaner than that. Yeah. Uh, and here the reason is because you have 15% error rate, right? And all these errors are mainly in Dells, and you can see that the purple small sign are in social deletion. Um, but one important thing with packed by your data is that this error is random or almost random. And uh, I will not, you will not, you will not be surprised if I tell you the mathematics randomness is your friend, right? So that means that if you get enough coverage, and this is a zoom on this region when you see the indels, if you have enough coverage, these errors are going to cancel each other, right? The chance of having the error at the same spot is very small. So if you have enough coverage and do a consensus of these sequences, you're coming close to the right answer. Um, if you take some Illumina errors, the one person error in the Illumina is more systematic. And this, um, you will not be able to correct that. But with Spark Bio, you cannot approach this. So meaning that you can take a, a bunch of these Spark Bio sequences, very low quality, assemble them, and with the amount of data that we overlap, you'll be able to reach a decent um, quality. Uh, in the past, people have been adding Illumina on top of that to even polish more uh, the sequences. So before you move on, on uh, because usually when I, when I show this slide here, I ask people, okay, so which are the errors here and we, we, which one are, you know, let's say true variants? Well, this is an easy question for you, but just is there anyone willing to like well, what, yeah. what about this? The, the... Nick, what do you think? See, I put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, can you repeat the question? <laughs> Here you have a lot of, it's messy, right? It's a messy alignment. You have a lot of different colors and things that are going on. It's And uh, uh, Olivier said, uh, coverage is your friend in genomics, right? And, and particularly in genome assembly, because you basically you remove the errors or you understand which are errors of the sequencing platform or the sequencing machine and which are actually real variants by uh, looking at the alignment, okay? So here, there are different things. And some are errors, some others are variants with respect to the reference the reads were aligned to. I was just wondering if you, you could tell the difference. Yeah, um, most of the purple spots seem to be random except near the middle there's a line almost all the sequences have the same uh length of this uh purple region so i guess this is a real deletion or i'm, I'm not sure what what exactly this is but it seems to be consistent among the different um sequences right yeah yep yeah so the the, the big problem with the genoma um alignments is that even with long reads, the alignment can be deceiving because depending on the region that you're looking at, the alignment could be correct or not. Uh, and of course, uh, the fact that you're not necessarily aligning the reads from the same individual to the, the reference of that particular individual adds complexity to it. But yes, here there is there appears to be a few reads that support the reference, okay? While the majority of them actually has a, uh, a uh, deletion um, uh, in the, and so, yeah, so here the question is what's going on? And, and what, what about the other, like the, the SNPs or let's say the, the point errors, can you distinguish those? So here, actually, I think that the the no errors. Uh, because the errors were masked out, but you can tell, for instance, that there are two errors in the, the reads where there there is a G. There are two Gs, and they have, all the rest is A. So the reference is uh, is T because it's uh, uh, I think I believe it is T. Then you have A's, and then you have a bunch of errors, the C and two Gs in there, and uh, and that's uh, of course. Uh, it's, it's what you're actually looking for, right? All the other stuff, it's, uh, let's say, uh, it's, it's not interesting, but actually that's what you would like to do 
when you are calling variants uh, from sample. Sorry, never meant to, didn't mean to interrupt you all your questions. That's fine, interrupt me anytime. Okay. <laughs> I will. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> So, okay, so long read matters, um, as I mentioned earlier, not only because of the repeats, um, but long read technology as also single molecule um, technology, meaning no amplification, no GC bias. Um, so why GC bias is a problem? So this is a paper from Colac et al, uh, from, my, from my group, from my group in, uh, in 2017, that uh, compared the a new genome, um, you can see in Zebra Finch here, um, generated with pack bio, pack bio data versus the singer version of it, and Hummingbird, the Illumina version of it versus the pack bio data on it. Um, on, in red, you can see that there's a gap, and in, in black, there was an assertion. So it looked, So what, what, what happened is you have these missing sequences in Zebra Finch and missing sequences in Hummingbird. And this, more, the, the biggest one here is in the promoter of a gene. And promoters of a genes are usually IGC content. So what happened is these uh, Illumina reads um, where the data set was depleted in reads in this region. So it couldn't be assembled. When you, look, when you go back to the original raw data, you still see these sequences in it, but there were not enough of them to be able to be assembled properly. So this is a big issue because you're going to miss part of genes, the regions, um, you're going to, to lose all gene as well um, if you use short read sequencing. So this is a big advantage to be able to, uh, to use long reads is, is completeness yeah. of the genome. And, and uh, I mean, uh, to support that even more, I mean, it's really an issue if you start to have a missing sequence within genes or next to genes because yeah. Your gene predictions, your annotation of genes is highly impacted, negatively impacted by, uh, by, by that. It could mix exons, you could you know, have a frame shifts that are introduced artificially. Uh, you could have a lot of things. So one, one thing I always say is never trust the reference genome you're using or whatever re reference genome you're looking at. Reference genomes contain a lot of errors, even the, uh, the high quality ones. So never trust the sequence that you, you uh, as, as it is. Try to validate uh, as much as you can because they contain this, uh, a lot of these kind of problems. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure you guys talk about it during RNA seq section. Um, I always ask people to visualize the palaps and see where they are in the reference genome to see if there is any anything anomalous. Um, that's very important to look at. So another uh, third generation sequencing technology is Oxford Nanopore. So Oxford Nanopore is pretty cool. Uh, first of all, it's much smaller sequencer. Um, I have one here. So I like to show the sequencer. I mean, I show that every time. Um, I cannot show you the pack bio sequencer, it's much bigger. Um, so how does it work? So you have a membrane, a membrane that has a resistance. Maybe we, we can organ, I mean, I don't know if with COVID, maybe we can organize tours at some point. So if you want, someone wants to see the, the actual pack bio. I mean, that is a big plastic box, but yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, so you have these protein pores that are embedded into a membrane that has electrical, electrical current going into that. This electrical current creates a ion flow through the pore. So now you have the library of, of, of your DNA that is bound onto what they call here unwinding enzyme, but people could also, also call it a motor enzyme. Um, that we help to uh, unwind the sequence into the pore. Uh, what is not shown here is the tether sequence that will help the DNA to go toward the pole. But anyway, so the DNA goes in the pole, the single strand. So this enzyme is going to deplace the strands and only one is going through. When you have a molecule going through the pole, you will disrupt the ion current. But you will disrupt um, in proportion to the size of the nucleotide or, or the type of molecule. And this, each molecule have a different signature. So you can identify what A is, 
what to see, what to see, depending on how the current has been disrupted. So the beauty of that is, I showed you earlier with PacBio um, that you have one DNA in each well and one sequence per well, and that's only one sequence per well. Here, when the pore is done with one sequence, another can come and go to it. Another can come after that until the pole dies, right? It's a protein, so it doesn't have a, it has a short lifetime, but you can sequence very long reads and a lot of them. So it's very promising technology. Um, I also have IRO rate. Again, this has changed recently. So, um, but you can also generate extremely long sequences. So I told you back bio, you get about 50 KB. Here we're talking about, you can generate megabase sequences. It's hard. They're rare, but you can. Actually, the, I think the world record is two megabase. Uh, and that was only one reader. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you can understand anything with that, but. Uh, <laughs> and actually, it was reconstructed, I think, if I recall correctly, it was reconstructed afterwards because the machine is not even um, supporting it. The, 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 the algorithms uh, don't even support it. So when you see a super long molecule like that, the, the software thinks it's more than one molecule and is going to uh, chop it into pieces. So they, they, they reconstructed it afterwards. Yeah. Don't expect that kind of output all the time. But, no, so what you should expect 50 KB, 80 KB. Uh, uh, so it's a very nice and very cheap sequencing type. Um, um, as a, you probably will talk about it later, but it has been used for genome assembly. Um, in comp com it's complementing very well packed by your data. Actually, I, I was curious to know, I don't know if there is a way to do that, but if, if people in the, I mean, they, they have experience with PacBio or with Nanopore already uh, with data analysis or data generation for their own projects. Is there a way, I don't see the full function yet, but is there a way to, do you know, Matt? Uh, I can set up a quick poll. Um, it will take me a couple minutes, but I, I'll set up. Oh, People can raise their hands on the chat. Let's see how we resume with the poll, and then yeah. Do you think that this technology could have the potential to replace uh, traditional sequencers if they increase uh, the length of the sequences that can be done on such nice yeah, well, things? This. Uh, They've been talking about that for four years now. They need to replace it, replace it, replace it. But this is an arm race, right? Every time uh, Nanopore does something new, PacBio does it too. Uh, now I will say that um, PacBio is winning right now, and I will show you later why. Um, but Nanopore still have a niche, and they're improving every, every year. Um, so they, they're going to catch up. The big advantage of nanopore is the size of the instrument. Even the biggest instrument, you can put that in the kitchen. I mean, um, so you can even sequence on the field. I think that's a big, um, big niche. For the extremely long reads, it's more than just by uh, nanopore. It's about the, the extraction method and, and the library prep that is very tricky. I just want to say that I'm not sure if the question was more about Illumina versus Nanopore and PacBio. Oh, okay, sorry. I think it was Nanopore versus PacBio. Uh, it was uh, Nanopore versus uh, the traditional big sequencers. Oh. The traditional will never catch up. So the, Nanopore is going to replace. The Illumina, so that the, there is this nice story if you, if you want to know that the um, Illumina, I think, it knows too well that is uh, is losing is losing the tech the technological uh, uh, race at least. So Illumina is a giant. Uh, it's uh, ninety percent of the uh, market, seventy percent of the whole sequencing, I think, in the in the world. And so, of course, uh, being such a, a large company, it's very hard to replace. But it, I think it was three years ago now that. They tried uh, and started the process of purchasing PacBio because they, I think, they because they understand that the future is in long read technologies in any case, uh, especially now that the, as we'll see, the PacBio uh, sequencing technology is actually matching the quality of Illumina reads, but with uh, also longer, much longer uh, sequences. 
Uh, this didn't end up well because the, um, well, they, there was a very large deal and uh, Pagbay was going to get a lot of money. Uh, but uh, the, 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 uh, the way I read it actually was that, uh, so Nanopore is uh, basically from the UK, okay, Oxford Nanopore. And uh, uh, Pagbay is, let's say, more US uh, uh, based. And uh, the, a court uh, in, in the UK ruled that if uh, Nanopore, sorry, if, if uh, Illumina was to purchase Pagbio, then Illumina could not sell their products, whether they were Pagbio or Illumina, in the UK. And this led to the uh, breaking the deal. Uh, and the reason probably, I mean, I suspect is more political because of course they wanted to protect Nanopore as a uh, national company. That's my interpretation at least. being very cynical. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> the thing legally what happened is that um, there was a monopoly issue, right? So uh, the legals were afraid that from three companies that are dominating the, the sequencing world market, you will reduce to two, and that would be it. That's true, but uh, as a matter of fact, in the US, they, they were allowed to do that. As yeah. just the UK that stopped, but the, the UK market is so large that Illumina decided not to uh, use any work. So I see that there is a, a result here. So most of the attendants never. Um, well, I don't know if uh, if you use it for anything else, but I see at least there are a few people that use uh, Pagbaya Nanopore. Who who is that? Do you want to tell us a bit more about what, what you're doing? Just to you know, we say the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> who is that? Come on, speak up. Nanopore users, Pagbaya users. Can you repeat the question one more time, <laughs> and then I think someone else is going to answer it. <laughs> So now I, I'm just curious to know who used PugBio or Nanopore, what they did with that. Hi, we use PugBio. Uh, it's mostly for bacterial genomics projects to try and close bacterial genomes. And cool. uh, probably the reason why I'm attending this course is that I, I didn't succeed to close these genomes yet, so I hope. <laughs> I will learn the new skills from you guys as well. I've tried like a few, a few approaches also like with, you know, the new approaches that use uh, like mm, subsetting the, a lot of breeds and then do a lot of different trees like circular assemblies and then combine them to try and close them, but yeah, like, like tricyclary. Yeah. I'm sorry, I said that assembling bacterial genomes is a trivial issue these days, and no offense intended. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It depends what the bacteria, maybe. That's why I'm here. <laughs> cool. Who, who uses nanopore? I'm curious. Who has been using nanopore? No? Looks like Yost in, in the chat has used nanopore. Oh. Oh, sorry, I don't have the chat up. No, that's okay. It's, um, he put in, oh, I don't know, uh, Yozin, not sure, gender. I'm using Nanopore to do some bacterial genome sequencing. Okay, cool. Okay, well, here we're talking about, uh, like, what, what we presenting here is mostly few orders of magnitude more than bacterial genomes. Uh, and I would say that these genomes, the, the long reads are uh, really essential. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I lost my thing. No, no, it's uh, like, all right. Here. Did you skip something here? No, no, it's uh, yeah, this one. Oh yeah. So um, another technology that is pseudo long read is the linked read technology. Um, this is something that has been originally developed about 10 genomics, but yes, since then they stopped doing it for like patent issues. Um, so the companies like Telseek, uh, Universal Sequencing, are providing the same, same type of lab reads. So essentially what you're getting in output is not one long contiguous sequence, but several shorter sequences that we know are linked together 
So it's like um, almost like a mosaic, like you have a non-sequence, nothing, non-sequence, nothing, but you know how they link it. So the way it works is you have these, um, these beads, um, they're called gems, um, these gel bead in emulsions. So essentially they're little bubbles um, inside oil. Um, and in each of these gems, um, you will have a handful of DNA pieces. We're talking about long DNA pieces, 50 KB, 60 KB or more. So, so you, you collect all, the, all these gems. You create what they call isothermal incubation, which is essentially a PCR. And inside those, each of these fragments are going to be amplified in small pieces. So you're going to, you're going to have interdispersed small pieces. They're going to be amplified in this bubble. Um, but during amplification, a unique barcode is going to be put on it. So now what you have is a unique barcode for each bubble. And you have a subset of the genome in each bubble. So when you're going to after make your aluminum library and sequence all these reads, you'll be able to know in advance what reads goes with which one. So it's very similar in a sense to what Judo was talking about, about how to assemble genome. Um, here, you don't try to do a short, real shotgun. You're doing a, a shotgun by dividing the genome in pieces. Yeah, that, well, this is not a principle that was, uh, again, uh, new. It's uh, the same principle of using the bacterial artificial chromosomes you know, to, to divide the bigger problem into smaller problems. The thing here is that, again, the technology has driven this to a point that you can actually have these uh, microfluidics uh, and these chambers where these reactions can take place uh, successfully. So it's very high throughput. So uh, you, you take your high molecular weight DNA, uh, and then it's going to the microfluidic will divide them into emulsion beads and, and put adapters. And yeah, it's pretty, and there was a machine for that. So it, it's very streamlined. Um, so now with this type of information, you'd be able to span uh, 50 KB, 70 KB of data, right? So now you're going to have some gaps that you see in this figure, some gap, we don't know what it is, but hopefully you will have another bead in the gem that will have an overlapping region of that, where the gaps, because they're random, will be at different places. So altogether, you should be able to span another KB of complete sequence. Yeah, people are maybe more familiar with this technology when it comes to uh, single cell genomics, because that's what they're most famous for. It's the same principle, except that instead of cell RNA as well, yeah, yeah, in, in, instead of embedding one cell in one of these uh, uh, bubbles, you actually have a, a, a single long uh, DNA molecule. So now, uh, and what was very attractive with this technology that is Illumina sequencing at the end of, of the end of the process. So you have very high quality sequence. All right, but the winner as the, the, the 10X is gone, as you said, for the patent. Yeah. There are now two technology, two, two companies providing this. One is Telstick, and there is also a Chinese- uh, BGI, they one. Yeah. yeah, BGI is providing this, which works. I mean, they, they, you can have a very decent quality reference genomes out of this in most cases. So the winner of all these competitions is PacBio again. So as I kind of said earlier, PacBio came out, came up with something, a big improvement that changed the game. So I think someone said they use a PacBio hi-fi for bacteria. Um, so how it works, you have uh, this double strand DNA, uh, large fragments, around 15 to 20 KB fragments. Um, each color is a different strand, yeah? You like it adapters. So these adapters are air pin. So they, it's a linear adapter, but topologically circular, meaning I will explain it in a minute what it means. So on this adapter, you have this primer, the black primer here, where the polymer is rebind. And as soon as it's in the well, sequencing happens. And what happens is polymer is going to displace the second strand. And you see when you displace it, because you have this airpin adapters on each side, you create a circle. And the problem is you go around multiple times to sequence the same template. So now this is still single molecule sequencing because the same molecule you're sequencing over and over again, right? So you can see that you, you, you're sequencing the negative strand, the adapter, positive strand, 
adapter, negative strength, and, and keep going. Now, you still have the discrete impersonal error rate. That's what you see on the red dot. But again, error rate with pack bio is random. So same thing when you take ones like regular pack bio consensus kind of cancel all the errors. Here it's like within doing the same thing. And the consensus of all these subreads and you get a perfect high accuracy rate. And we're talking about at least at least 99% accuracy, which is in power with Illumina, which Illumina is about 1% error rate or less. This is in power with Illumina. It's beautiful. And they're 15 to 20 KB long. So now this changed the game, why? Um, because not only you, you have a long read, you have no amplification and you perfect read. That means that you could sequence through repeats very easily. Because when people talk about repeats, they think that repeats are exactly the same sequence repeated multiple times. Well, there are mutations, right? So the sequence is slightly different. And when you sequence 20 KB of these repeats, each region of the repeat will have a different signature in terms of mutations. So because these are high quality reads, you can differentiate them and order them in a proper way. So um, I'm sure Julia has something to say about it. <laughs> I could talk for hours about these reads. <laughs> No, it's. Uh, I would maybe add that the this is really the big thing now in in genomics. The hi-fi reads, uh, they have not been out there for long. And we're talking about the last two years, uh, one of which was in during the pandemic, so it doesn't count. Uh, the actually the the technology behind this was there for a while because Pagmaya was uh, um, uh, commercializing this for amplicon sequencing. Uh, uh, it was called, it, it's actually still formally uh, defined as a circular consensus sequencing, CCS. They were very short. And, and yeah, so they were very short. And the, 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 the big uh, game changer was the fact that they increased the throughput, the overall throughput. So now they can actually uh, scale up and have much longer reads. Of course, a lot of other things changed, uh, like the chemistry improved, the algorithms improved. Uh, but this has been really a game changer in the last two years, as uh, Olivia will tell you in a moment. And uh, I, I, at present, I don't see reason except for maybe the cost that would um, uh, uh, basically make anyone choose in short reads from Illumina uh, over this for a lot of different uh, projects. It's maybe not well known, but it's, it's there. The, the last thing I would say is that, yes, the error rate is very similar. But the error profile, so the, the, the kind of errors that you see is still a bit different because the hi-fi uh, is say, suffering from the same kind of errors that the CLRs uh, reads from PugBio, so the previous technology with the, the 10 to 15% error rate uh, had, uh, that is indels. So most of these errors are still indels. In fact, they are almost perfect reads uh, if you don't consider the indels. But here we're talking about much fewer indels, so that's, that's the key. So I would like to put a caveat on short reads a slab in each, but not for genome assembly, <laughs> right? If you want to do RNA seek or chip seek, or go with short reads for sure. But for genome assembly, don't go with short reads. That was the no point. Yeah, at some point, the genome, the, the short reads will only be used for ancient DNA, which is fragmented anyway up front. So yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, a, a good example of the use of these high quality pack bio reads, high fi reads, is this paper from Lobson and Al from the Evil Nightclub Lab, where they took the CH, CHM13 cell line. So for those who are not familiar with this cell line, um, this is a human cell line that use um, the genetic um, mutation of, I don't know if I can pronounce that, I that you deform essentially what you get is the, you don't the um, the genetic um, code of the sperm will replace completely the one from the egg. So what you get is still a diploid egg or diploid cell, but now with two X's. Um, um, so you you essentially get an haploid uh, cell line. So why is that important? Because in genome assembly. Um, assembling a diploid or polyploid genome is very challenging um, because you don't know which piece belongs to which. Um, so they simplify the problem by having this cell line that they know is, is technically haploid. 
Um, so they have only one problem to resolve, which is the repeats. Um, because you can imagine if you have a deployed and you have repeats, you don't know if repeats goes to which deployed and where in the repeat become more complex. So yeah, in fact, the, the, sometimes people define uh, the, the deployed scenario where you have two copies as having a, an entire uh, repeat element that is identical or the two copies of the, the genome. And as we know, repeats are a problem and this is a, you know, a problem at the whole genome scale. So th this paper is a beautiful paper where they were able for the first time to complete one human chromosome, the chromosome eight. Um, so they're able to span the centromere um, that is composed of like satellite and nasty thing like um, alpha satellite, satellite and, and they, they validated their study by using a restriction enzymes and, and cut and run on a gel. And they were confirming the length of the sequence they were able to, uh, to identify. So it's a, it's a beautiful um, stunt. Um, very, now more, more chromosomes have to be done um, and deployed cell lines will be, uh, have to be done. But this is a big major advancement in, in genomics because the human genome is not done, it's not, it's not finished. And so this is something that uh, this consortium, the telomere to telomere consortium, or T2T, aim to resolve. So here on top, you see that's a human genome. And it's more common on the previous slide. Yeah. Sorry. That's fine. The, well, because I think it's a beautiful picture. So the, the, the um, triangular uh, heat map that you have at the bottom of the HRA for the centromere repeat. This is the very first time that was demonstrated we can actually study the evolution of uh, centromeric repeats. Now it is very simple and therefore complex to assemble uh, regions of the genome that, as uh, Olivier said, are, let's say, uh, at least uh, in the even the current reference for the human not uh, assembled. It's you can actually see that the toward the, the the middle of the centromeric repeat there is a lot of uh, a similarity, and the more you distance from it, actually this similarity tends to be lost which is uh, compatible with the model that it basically see the, the generation of these repeats starting in the centromeric region and then spreading uh, toward the ends of it. Uh, and now you can really study them. You can really uh, study them. And we know that the centromeric repeats are actually associated with diseases, but they were actually not accessible to, uh, to investigation prior to this. Yeah. Yeah, this is amazing. Uh, do you know Julio has been published yet? Because it's in bioarchive. I didn't see the publication. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they have, they have more business to do. Some of which with us with this uh, telomere to telomere consortium. I don't know. Um, uh, actually, as a fact, this was a first uh, proof of principle. But uh, as you will see, uh, uh, this was now. I mean, uh, applied to many other chromosomes, and we're almost uh, done. So that's probably why they are still all. Right. So I'm probably going to butcher that, but this is a human genome and you see the context and the gaps. Um, so like chromosome one, you're missing the central mirror. So the human genome is pretty much complete except for the central mirrors, essentially. Um, as I mentioned earlier, here is the chromosome eight. You can see that, that's essentially finished. And the chromosome X has been finished by the collaborator of ours, um, but more, more, more chromosome need to be done. And this is, the ultimate goal of the T2T consortium that Julio is part of. Um, and, and actually the, the other, the, 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 the one below here actually is how they completed the chromosome X. Yeah. Because the chromosome X was missing the, the centromere repeat. And this was actually done with nanopore instead of PacBio. That's why Olivia said they keep competing to eat with each other. No, it's uh, uh, before the advent of iFi, the um, uh, the same consortium using nanopore reads at very high depth, where you start to have, you know, if you start to sequence very, very deep, what happens is that you will start to have enough of these ultra long reads that we were mentioning before that you can even have, uh, you can even span, you know, entire, uh, uh, not the, the, necessarily the entire centromeric repeat, but enough so that you can actually walk through the centromere, which is what you see depicted here. So basically you use the very little variants that are found in the centromeric repeats, okay, to anchor your alignment and walk uh, through the, 
uh, the, the sequence. So you see the, the colors here stands for this unique mark, the color here at the bottom, yeah, they stands for unique markers that were used to anchor the reeds and walk through the rest of the, the centromere. Because of course, I mean, the centromeres are very, very similar, but not identical, so that you can uh, exploit that variation to, to reconstruct it. And this was published in Nature, Nature I think, last year. There's a question in chat, if either of you could grab the chat. So suppose I have an exon one gene X that has a codon Z. The same codon extends into multiple copies in different individuals. But we do not know how many expansions of the codon Z are present in each individual. Could you suggest a way to quantify the number of expansion in that exon using RNA-seq data from those individuals? I will do genomic and use targeted, right? When you say codon, what do you mean by codon? Codon, do you mean just a single codon or mean an entire gene? Well, anyway, if you, if you, okay. okay. So if, if you, have, you have multiple copies of the same uh, triplet, so, the, so the, there is a technology with um, PacBio they call IsoSeq. It's um, it's RNA seq on, st on steroid essentially. So you get like full length transcripts. So if you do um, a full length full length transcript approach with PacBio on different individuals, you will span the whole thing and, and identify the exact number of codons. Codon Z. But let, let's be more uh, clear here. I mean, are we talking about like CAG repeats uh, of Huntington disease or other, other diseases like that? This kind of repeat expansions that were, is that what you're trying to quantify? Okay, okay. So, well, I worked on Huntington disease for a while, so I know a lot about this topic. The uh, PAC Bio has protocols uh, specifically for this kind of uh, regions. So it will be, as uh, Olivia said, uh, basically targeted sequencing, okay? Uh, there are also nice protocols using CRISPR to um, basically fish out the, the DNA that contains the region so that you don't have to sequence the entire, the entire genome, okay? So you enrich for that particular region and then uh, you sequence. Uh, of course, I mean, if the reads are too short, like in Illumina and uh, the number of copies is too long, like in this case, that wouldn't work. But actually with the hi-fi reads that are 20 KB, I, I, I can imagine that you have no issues at all because you will be able to span the entire gene and yeah. depend, it doesn't matter how many copies. What you may want to do here is to uh, shorten the length of your reads so that you make many more passes and you can estimate which much, with much more accuracy the length uh, of your uh, repeat. Yeah. But, but, but I think the two approaches, targeted genomics or Transcriptomics will work in this case. But yeah. No. PCR. Uh, with the targeted um, genomics, you, there was no PCR. They use CRISPR to, uh, um, for ISOC, there will be PCR. Yeah. But, but Pagbaya has convincing data now with all these diseases that are, are caused by repeat expansions. They, they get very beautiful results. I mean, at this point, you can actually genotype people uh, pretty easily. Yep. All right. All right, so this is a quick slide about the, the T2T consortium again. So Julio already said that um, if you remove homopolymers from your sequences. So homopolymers, it's not a rare type of variants you see in the human genome but they're very problematic for sequencing, right? Um, so in, in Illumina, you get very few, sequ very, very few um, sequences coming out of homopolymers. And in PacBio, what you're going to have, you're going to have uncertainty of the length of the homopolymer, right? So, but if you remove this homopolymer from the sequences, the rest of the bases are virtually perfect. So, that to highlight the fact that these alpha reads um, still have issues, the same issue than the other um, type of technologies, but it's perfect for the ones 
that don't have any more problems. Yeah, Bucho, well, Julio, that's fine. Absolutely. Uh, I can add one thing about the how, why this happens. And I think it's, it becomes obvious if you think about the way these reads are generated and the different ways they're regenerated in Illumina versus uh, uh, PacBio, for instance. In Illumina, you, you're, you have stacks, so you have these levels and you sequence one layer at a time. You know? So for, for you sequence a lot of molecules in parallel, but every step you sequence one nucleotide. So basically you don't get, uh, I mean, it's, it's harder to get a problem than to get an issue because uh, you're only adding one nucleotide at a time. By contrast in PacBio and Nanopore, the sequencing is continuous. So it means you keep sequencing and it's basically you're getting this uh, sequence over time, okay? And therefore, if you think about that, being able to precisely, I, identify where one nucleotide uh, stops and there is the next nucleotide is much, much more challenging. Right? This Remember the C noise is, is light, essentially. So if you have too many A's in a row, you may see like five, li five lights instead of seven, right? Now you have to be able to say, okay, there are five lights lasting for five seconds. So it's five nucleotides, but maybe it actually was six or it was four. Oh, and a bit faster and you miss it or but by contrast, that they actually being able to tell, okay, there is a different nucleotide coming, that's much easier. Yeah. So Illumina has, I mean, claiming that don't have this problem homopolymers, but this is not completely true, right? So there is a certain type of homopolymers that can create palindromes. So essentially you have a series of A's and a series of T's. This library will fold and will not be able to sequence properly, right? So you create this R pin. Um, and you can also take it. So Illumina is less of an issue, but still some issues in certain cases. All right, so T2T. -T. So this is what Julio is working on with the, uh, this large consortium is to resolve the human genome. And this is, I think, show me, told me Julio, this is old slide and things are better now. But what you look at here is assembly graph. Each long string is a chromosome. And this represents are the contents that are connected to each other. So when you see the cr chromosome two here, it's almost perfectly uh, assembled. If you look at this last chromosome here, you have more ambiguities. So I don't have it here, but if I show you the assemblies from the older version of that, you will see a big improvement. What you get with older version of the assemblies, you would get these big balls of, of strength, right? And here you're able to like, uh, distinguish them and make them very linear with no ambiguities. Want to say something on that, Julia? Well, I mean, this is just uh, one of the, if you are a bioinformatician dealing with genome assembly, this is exceptional. This is uh, yep. something that. Except for bacteria. Except for bacteria, yeah. No, but thinking about this as a being a human being, this is amazing because here you have. T to T for most of the chromosomes. So that means there is no gap, there is no ambiguity, there is no uncertainty. There's some few ambiguities, but yeah. not, not much. Yeah. yeah, the one that was actually highlighted there, uh, the last one, that where there is more complexity, it's the RDNA. Now there is this repetitive yeah. element uh, that uh, encodes for the ribosomal units. Uh, and there are, I think, five repeats of that kind in the human genome. They're very similar to each other. All the units are very similar to each other. That's why we're still uh, kind of failing to, to resolve them completely, but we're working on it. I mean, not me, but some people are working on it. So hopefully that will be some, soon fixed as well. But all the rest is, is uh, and this is recovering, I think between 100 and 200 megabases of data that was never seen before, even for humans. So. Even if you think about the reference genomes that was published in 2001 and updated until now, the best possible source that is out there, that it's missing 100, uh, between 100 and 200 megabases of repetitive stuff that has been now resolved uh, with the hi-fi reads and the to algorithm. Give you, to give you a, a context and a scale here, chromosomes are about 200 megabases or 150 megabases. So essentially you are missing the amount of data that will go into a chromosome. Yeah. 
that uh, that was a huge amount of data that was missing. And uh, and it, one could think all oh, these are repeats, so this is junk DNA, but that's not true because actually it's progressively more uh, clear that actually repetitive elements play a big role in biology. And also sometimes there are actually genes within those repeats that you don't get to assemble because they are you know surrounded and contain repeats. So so we, we find new genes as well. So probably there, there are some biological questions that will be answered just by the fact that we have access to this extra 200 megabases. So, um, so I, sh I show you long reads and long read technology where you can take um, a, gen a, a genome or DNA fragmented in large pieces and assemble them together. And that's what we call contigs. So contigs are essentially contiguous um, sequences that have been assembled from it, right? But the next question is, how do you um, put together contexts, right? How do you really link them together? Because eventually that's what you want to do. That's what we call step scaffolding. Scaffolding is essentially ordering and, and, and linking contexts together. So to give you an idea, in birds, for instance, a contig and shift is a metric. You get contigs about 14 megabase, 20 megabase long, right? But chromosomes are 100 megabase. So you need at least two or three of these contigs or more to create a chromosome. So how do you get to the scaffold? Uh, because short, there is a reason why the reads couldn't be assembled into a large chromosome because these areas are difficult to sequence or difficult to assemble, but you still want to have this information. Um, what, one way is to use what they call optical mapping, and I show IC or different methods. Essentially, it's technology that will not fill the gap, but will be able to link the context together by different sequence specificity or, or uh, density of some restric restriction sites. So the most commonly used one, um, it's, uh, one of them is optical mapping. Uh, so BioNano has created this technology um, which is it's not a sequencer, it's essentially a big microscope. So what you have, you have primers of DNA that have been labeled for a particular restriction site, right? So now you have this gigantic piece of DNA that has 300 KB, one megabase, very long, that have this pattern of, as you see on, on the right picture, pattern of a sequence, a label that is marked, and a non-sequence label that is marked. So this DNA is going to be detangled and linearized to this pillar and go through a nano channel. And then you, you take pictures of this nano channel. And when the DNA is migrating to it, uh, you'll be able to have now an image for each DNA molecule, each single molecule that will tell you the pattern of these restriction sites. So this is how the data looks like. You can see all this crime on DNA migrating through these channels and the green represent the backbone dye of the DNA. So we know that was DNA, yeah? And the orange represent the marking for each restriction site or label site. So the beauty of this technology is not only you can identify this, um, the pattern, but also you identify the, the distance between this pattern, right? So you can scale it, scale it and know that there is 10 megabase uh, distance between these two uh, labels. So you can use that for um, finding subtle variants. So if you have a reference genome and you have this new individual, you, uh, you run optical mapping and you're going to align it to the reference genome and see where these markers are going to line up. So each of these yellow line or blue line has different markers, at the re re different labels. And you align them and see, for instance, here you have an assertion. But you can also use it for scaffolding. So same idea, you identify the pattern on one contig, a pattern on the other one, and you look for this optical map read that will connect these two contigs together. So not only are you going to connect them together, but you will know exactly how much distance is between the two. Um, the other technology that is often used is IC. Um, I see originally, so I explain what IC is. IC is a technology that allows you to, um, to look at the 3D structure of the genome, right? How the chromosomes interact with each other, or different regions of the DNA interact with each other. 
So this was originally created to study the biology of the genome, right? The answers or what parts are, are connected to which part of the genome or, or regulated. Um, so essentially you want to have this map of which chromosome is close to the other one that may interact, um, which arm. Um, but we can take the same information and use it for scaffolding. So the way the technology works is you take the live cell or the, the frozen cells, you cross-link the DNA inside the nucleus. You fragment it, ligate it. So now you're going to have this short fragment representing a junction and you're going to sequence it. So you're going to sequence all the junctions of DNA that were close to each other. Now, with probability, there was more chance DNA touch each other if they're close to each other. So you will have more chance to get a cis information, meaning that fragments from the same chromosome will touch uh, each other. Um, so if you look for the biology of answers and regulation, that's not what you're interested in. You're interested in the region of the chromosome that interact together, right? Of different chromosomes, the trans interaction. So here is a plot of IC. So of the diagonal, this is all the trans interactions, meaning that um, that's the biology acting. In the diagonal is where you you have the same chromosome, original from the same chromosome interacting with each other. So you can identify chromosome. So now you can you can use this data, this information to scaffold context together, right? So you, you're going to map all your reads of the junctions onto the context. And because you know these reads are connected, you'll be able to order and, and put together the different parts of the genome. And so I, oh, yeah, go ahead, Joe. Just, just want to say that we're going to uh, talk about the, 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 the plot in more in detail tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I would like to finish on highlighting something very important. Um, and I cannot say that a bit before. The limitation right now is going to be how good your DNA is going, can you get to enter this technology? Because now technology is set to be so performant. Uh, the performance of this technology is so high to get long reads, you need to provide long DNA. So we call that i away DNA and it could be very challenging to get. This is an example from Juro's paper where you can see here Fragments above 300 KB is what you're looking for. Um, DNA with very high integrity. So this is another frontal pulse when you see a peak, very large DNA. This is crucial for pack bio, a bit less because of hi-fi, but still. Um, nanopore, when you talk about one megabase reads, you need to be able to provide one megabase piece of DNA. Right? Yeah, and this is, uh, I mean, of course, you, you cannot reconstruct something that. Uh, no matter how good your reads are, or how good your algorithms are, if it's already broken into pieces, you, there is nothing you can do to reconstruct it. Um, and of course, I mean, if it's a cell line, that's not a big deal because probably you can extract a high quality DNA in abundance. But if you have a sample coming from the uh, rainforest, that's a different story. Yeah. And this is the last slide of of this section is just to try to put together all the information I provided you about technologies. So Pack Bio are long read um, sequencing data that allows you to create the context. And then Julio will show later that what we can do with this context. You can scaffold them using the 10X link reads. Remember link reads that provide you this um, long range information about how the sequence are ordered, the binary optical map and the high C information. So this is a VGP pipeline um, that Drew is going to describe and you're going to, to use in exercises today. Um, that is an iterative process. You create the context, you add one technology for the first scaffolding, second technology. Uh, because this is all pipeline where you use packed by your original data, you still need to do some polishing as well to correct the errors that are remaining in the packed by your data. Um, and Julio? Yeah, so I think, uh, first of all, if you have like questions, maybe we can 
spend a few minutes with that. And then I think we, we could have a, a small break and then start with the let's say more bioinformatic side of this. Um, so how does that sound, Matt? Sounds good to me. Okay, so any questions? No? Okay, so I don't know, 10 minutes? Five, 15, I don't know. <laughs> it's 5.34, so uh, it's 3.34, so 3.45. Yeah, okay, so it's good. Sounds good to me. Perfect. See you all.
All right, I don't know if everyone is back, but we still have one more minute to go. Okay, I think we can start again. Uh, the well, I, is well, of course I can't ask if someone is missing, but hopefully everybody's there. So, her, just uh, uh, one note before we, we we get started. The idea, of course, with this uh, course is to provide an introduction. Okay, many of these topics uh, can take uh, uh, courses by themselves. So, of course. Uh, we, we cannot do much in, in, in six hours, but the, the idea was really to provide an overview from the historical, pers historical perspective to the uh, technologies that are involved in, uh, in genome assembly, the, the underlying bioinformatical prin uh, principles, and of course, uh, um, also the, the applications. And then the next uh, session, so on Thursday, we're going to try to apply uh, some of these bioinformatic principles uh, to a real case. Uh, and we'll talk about this uh, at the end of the uh, presentation. So today's uh, theoretical, uh, the next one will be uh, more practical. The idea here, uh, well, actually I, I, I forgot to rename this slide. I copied pasted it from another slide because here we, have, we still have a section to go uh, we have a few slides about the, let's say, the importance of having high quality reference genomes using these long grade technologies. Why is really, does it really matter? Why, even if you have to uh, plan, uh, you know, to um, think about an experiment uh, or an entire project, you should really carefully consider which technology uh, is best suited to answer your question because that's actually uh, the key uh, to success. So, so we, we are big fans of long reads. I mean, I think uh, Olivia and I attended most of the conferences about long read sequencing uh, out there in the world. Um, I would say we are, Olivia much more than me, but early adopters of this technology when basically it didn't work and uh, you had to add faith that it was actually <laughs> possible to use it uh, before you get started. Uh, now it to, it's to the point that we said that it can actually replace entirely, except for the cost, it, it, can, it can entirely replace uh, Illumina. Maybe it's an overkill for some cases, but again, it, it's, uh, it, it's there at this point. Uh, so you can, of course, use it to assemble reference genomes. I would say that's the only way to go if you want to have a, a, a very good quality reference genomes. At this point, you can use it to understand genomic variability. Uh, it means that, uh, as your colleague before was asking, how can I, you know, look at the copy number variation of this particular uh, region? Uh, I mean, again, PubBio uh, particularly is the way to go because that's, uh, uh, you know, because of the, the, the read uh, length. Uh, but you, of course, will also allow you to uh, retrieve the classical uh, markers, the SNPs, uh, and so forth. But if you're really interested in, uh, you know, there's a more complicated, I don't know, inversions, and I will talk about this in a moment, uh, uh, or more, compl more complex events, uh, mutation events, uh, again, long reads uh, provide the answer. It was still possible, I mean, people, uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago, we're still uh, looking into what we call uh, structural variants uh, with short reads. Uh, it was more of a, a statistical approach, uh, especially period end reads helped a lot in that. But there is, a, I mean, there is no point that today the way to go is long reads for all this kind of things, from small events to large events. Uh, you can actually do epigenetics. Uh, this is not a course about epigenetics, so we're not going to discuss this fully, but just uh, for you to know that uh, with respect to Illumina, long reads actually provide you with the epigenetic signal uh, at the same time. So uh, you have a native DNA being sequenced 
and you collect also methylation patterns. Uh, uh, of course, I mean, uh, being able to do that requires careful, you know, experimental design, but it's actually possible both with Pacbio and Nanopore. Uh, and you actually collect a lot of epigenetic uh, signatures that you wouldn't be able to see with Illumina. Uh, especially, I think this is relevant for uh, those of you working with bacteria. Well, uh, one, one, one thing about epigenetic is, yeah. I don't know if you remember the one I mentioned that for Pacbio, we're taking a movie where um, you take a movie of the incorporation of the basis. Well, when you have a base modification, you're going to change the speed of incorporation of the nucleotide. And this, this kinetic information could be used to detect uh, base modification. Yeah. Okay. It's being used even in a study of uh, nasty regions like repeat, repeats, uh, perisyndromatic repeats to understand how the different patterns of methylation affect uh, this region. So. Again, it's not something out of the box, but uh, it's, uh, it's something uh, worth considering. As Olivier said, we have, of course, uh, uh, transcriptomics. I would say that, I mean, I, I know most people uh, these days, uh, I mean, uh, especially if they have a more, a more uh, tour at the bench, they actually do a lot of transcriptomics. Uh, Illumina is still very, very good at that. Uh, it, one reason for that is that, of course, the um, RNA space is much more limited than the um, genome space. Now, genome space is, well, first of all, is much more, is, is the largest fraction of the genome. It's where most repetitive elements are. So, of course, that's why long reads are particularly helpful. Uh, if you can't, when it comes to the, the genes, of course, they are small. Uh, they tend to be have unique sequences, so that, that that you can potentially still, you know, even with short reads and the, find the overlaps. But again, there are technologies in, in, the, in the realm of um, long reads that can really help. One of them is uh, this IsoSeq, which is basically pack bio sequencing using hi-fi reads of RNA of native RNA, uh, and you get full transcript in a single read. So you you get uh, a 20 kb long transcript uh, with all the um, all the exons one after the other, so you don't have to figure out what was the connection that linked all the exons. And this led to discovery, the discovery of many, many, you know, splicing, uh, alternative splicing um, combinations uh, and so forth. And of course, I mean, metagenomics, if again, you're dealing with bacteria, that's great because with uh, long reads, you can get you know, very small stuff in a single read, it's like a mitochondrial genome, or you can get uh, even, uh, you know, in a few reads or through a few reads, you can get the full length uh, of uh, a, um, the bacterial chromosome, okay? And if you have a pool of them all in the same, uh, I don't know, ADA sample, uh, of course you can sequence them all and instead of having to try to figure out uh, which read, which short read belongs to which, uh, you have very long reads that can tell you, uh, and you can, you know, separate the reads belonging to the different strains uh, very, very easily or much more easily. One thing about close crypto mix, I mean, there are limitations with long reads, uh, essentially is due to the throughput. So because you have less throughput with Black Bio and Nanopore, uh, you're going to tend to miss more of the low expressed genes. But also, um, there is no method yet to quantify the, the low expression level using long reads. Uh, again, it's because not enough throughput. Um, but soon, I think we should be able to do that. And you should be able to, to quantify every isoforms. Uh, Here again, throughput means cost of the sequence because you can always sequence at any cost. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The problem is that <laughs> your experiment is going to cost just too much. Okay, so when we were talking about genomic variation, and very, very uh, easily uh, here, of course, we we're talking about deletions, insertions. They can be short, they can be, you know, sing a single triplet, or they can be duplication of uh, genes of entire regions. They can, uh, uh, I mean, be inversions. They can be translocation from one chromosome to another, uh, expansion in, in repeats. Uh, and of course, all of this can be much more easily if uh, not. Uh, it's the only actual way to actually capture this uh, is, is actually long reads. Um, again, give you just uh, an idea of what we're talking about here, because most people, I think, are still uh, thinking about, you know, the variation in terms of uh, 
uh, single uh, nucleotide polymorphisms or single nucleotide variants, or, or at least uh, short indels. But what, it, what it's interesting is that if you uh, consider two human beings, okay, uh, it's true that actually uh, most uh, of the single events uh, that uh, make up the difference between these two human beings at the genomic level are uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, CMVs. Uh, but if you consider the number of base pairs that are affected, you know, and of course that's a proxy of also, you know, the, how many genes, how many uh, uh, features of the genome are actually involved, uh, it's not quite uh, the same story. So you have uh, SNPs that account for five megabases, indels, meaning short in, uh, insertion and deletion, three megabases, and the structural variants actually are 10 megabases that distinguish any uh, two human beings. That's why, I mean, the structural variance is, is considered sometimes the hidden variation uh, that is probably associated also with human disorders that are still uh, uh, not characterized. If we zoom out a bit and we look at you know, the difference between a human and, a, and the chimp, we're talking about 120 megabases overall, and we see the same pattern where basically the structural variance are in terms of bases affected uh, uh, overwhelming with respect to the single uh, SNPs. Uh, of course, we can look into these kind of events, this kind of structural variance. Once we have our constructed high quality genomes where all the chromosomes have been reconstructed, here we're comparing the chicken uh, assembly, uh, um, the current chicken assembly with, uh, well, that's something I was working on. So the Barnes-Wall genome assembly, which is high quality in that it's been using long reads, but at the time it was not, as you can see, we're not listing a few chromosomes here. We have still scaffolds. So these large chunks uh, that, um, relatively large chunks uh, that probably like few of them contribute to a single uh, chromosome. So you can see here that we can easily reorder and reorient them uh, according to the chicken genome. Okay, here we have chromosome one of the chicken, which is maybe broken down into five, six pieces in the in the Barnes wall assembly. Okay, and at the very least, we can now reorder them and try to start understand what these uh, events here that you can see as uh, inverted uh, regions, which basically would imply that there has been an inversion in one of the two uh, lineages. Uh, what uh, potential uh, evolutionary uh, meaning they have, or they are maybe just assembly errors where we have to correct. Uh, so what we want to achieve with these projects that we uh, discussed before, so the vertebral genomes project, the vertebral genome project and so forth, is this situation with all, for all species so that we can then compare them and study them and understand uh, really uh, their variation. Um, these kind of uh, you know events actually uh, occur uh, in non-coding regions, occur in coding regions. When they occur in coding regions, they lead to uh, complex uh, rearrangements potentially. So here you can see that there is a chicken on the on the one side, a zebra finch on the other side, and basically you can see that there all, there used to be uh, homology in terms of the gene order. But now this has been disrupted. Uh, of course, it could be more than one event that led to this. And there has been gene duplications, like this gene here in the chicken is found, is found in three copies in the zebra finch. Uh, this gene here, uh, it's still found, but you can see that there is another copy uh, over here. And then you can see that there has been a displacement basically of this region uh, here. Again, this could be a, a, an assembly error. You should, this was published, so I hope uh, it, it wasn't, but uh, the uh, again double check always you know, your your assemblies. And there are many ways actually to assess the quality of an assembly. We're going to look into that, uh, especially uh, in the practical part. Uh, but again, it's very important that you um, uh, understand uh, if what you're seeing is real. But there are these kind of events, and it's actually very sometimes they're very important from a biological point of view. In fact, I would like to finish this uh, section, this quick section here with this uh, example, which I, uh, one of the ones I, I love the most. It's uh, about a bird species uh, that is found in Sweden and uh, uh, Northern Europe in general, uh, the rough. And basically it's um, one of the first examples, 2015. So here they're not even using long reads, but they, 
it's the first example, one of the first examples that structural variants are really, really important sometimes uh, in, uh, in bio, in, for biology. So I'm going to show you the video which explains everything. But here, this, the idea is that you have these three different morphs for the RAF. They, they coexist, they live together. They have a very different uh, uh, phenotype, phenotypes. Uh, and it all comes down to a single region of the genome that uh, generates them. So hopefully, I'm not sure, probably you're not gonna see the video, right? I need to share my screen again. Or no, you're still seeing it, right? But it's not working, yes. The rough is a lacking weight at the basic shore meadows and peat box in northern Eurasia. Males belong to one of three fixed alternative strategies. Independent males try to defend the territory as another lacking species. Satellites. I'm sorry, you can hear it well? Sounds good to me. Smaller and non territorial. They gain access to territories of independence by acting submissively. The third male strategy is called the feather. They're even smaller than satellites and obtain access to lakes and territories by mimicking females. So you see, there is this kind of male that looks like a female, and they coexist with the other male types the black, the black one, and the white one. Independents have to fight hard to establish and maintain their territories. This requires a lot of energy, and independents are often injured by their opponents. The independents are tightly clustered on the legs, standing one to two meters apart. Satellites are free to move across the territories of the independents, whereas an independent male trying to do the same would be attacked immediately. Males behave vigorously to attract flocks of flying females to the legs. After the females land, males will mix frozen pastures with bursts of activity to attract females within the leg. Females visit all legs in an area to inspect males, and usually mate with more than one male. Independence dominating satellites attract more females. The interaction between the independent and satellite serves as a form of ritualized fighting. Sometimes the independent will then get to mate with the female, but satellites may also get a chance to mate, especially if another independent enters the territory and distracts the territory holder. Often satellites are attacked while mating or afterwards. Here, a feather is moving across the leg. The feather doesn't interact with other males, it may copulate with soliciting females, especially if the territory holder is disturbed by neighboring males. Okay. So, well, I don't know if you'll appreciate this example, but let me just go back to it. So there are three male morphs, independent, satellite, and, and feather. And this one looks like the, the females. And here the, the, the thing is that the males have evolved three completely different uh, reproductive strategies. One is basically that of mimicking the females so that you don't get attacked by the other males and then you can copulate with them. What it's fascinating from uh, the genomicist perspective is that this complex uh, reproductive behavior is actually ancient. So we're talking about, I think it was 5 million years old um, event that led uh, to a, it's an inversion that actually led to the disruption of a gene, okay? And it was identified with the genome-wide association study that you see here. And this particular uh, inversion in this uh, region Again, it happened five million years ago, turned out to be a, a evolutionary stable strategy, okay? So of course I can imagine that the genome uh, over time adapted to it, but the point is that uh, this was uh, immediately uh, uh, viable and actually it's now find, found, as you can see, uh, in these uh, uh, populations 
Uh, and you have a, well, depending on the combinations uh, uh, in terms of homozygous and heterozygous, you can have different uh, phenotypes, but they all coexist. And again, they all belong to one single, they, they all um, uh, derive from this particular event, which is stable. So it's not like an aberration. It's not something that uh, it should be considered abnormal. It's actually a natural um, uh, variation that provides you with phenotype. And it's just a structural variant. Of course, there must be a gene involved in this case, but uh, it's, uh, I think it's an exceptional example. And it's not the only one. There are many, and after this study in particular, there are many other cases that have been detected of exactly the same kind of, uh, involved in different regions, different genes, but in birds, this is particularly uh, common. Uh, this in 2015 required a lot of work. Uh, I met these people at some point. And uh, now if you had the high fire reads, you could, you know, spot this particular region uh, and identify it and link it to the phenotypes uh, almost in a day, I think. Okay. So now we uh, switch gears completely and we uh, start to dive into uh, into the bioinformatics. I don't know if someone has comments or questions or not on the previous part or if Olivier, you have something to add. One, one. No, okay. So the basics, the real basics of, uh, uh, of genome assembly is the same as I would say most of the bio, bioinformatics in general, which is uh, finding the right alignments, okay? Uh, I think Jim Mayers at some point described bioinformatics as a, uh, at its core to be finding the, uh, or discriminating the good alignments from the spurious alignments uh, between reads, which as we have seen with, uh, with Sanger is actually true. So that, that's the, the whole point of it is reconstructing the final sequence of something or the finding the optimal alignment. And, um, and actually this is again, something that goes uh, a long way back, uh, at least I would say 50, 60 years. Uh, and it's really the core. Now, if you think about RNA-seq, again, you have to align something. If you think about finding structural variants, you have to align your reads and call the variants. If you have to generate an assembly, you have to find the overlaps between the reads, use these overlaps to walk through the sequence so that you reconstruct the, the complete sequence. And of course, there are thousands of ways or adaptations of the, the same approaches uh, to generate optimal alignment. Usually there is a, a trade-off between the accuracy and the speed, and depending on what you need to do, uh, you will decide for one, one way or another. Um, just to, you know, to give you uh, the overview of how this works, uh, of course, in principle, you could start from like what they call brute force alignment, which means that if you have two sequence and you want to align them to each other and you have no clue on how to do that, you could try to generate all possible alignments or all, all possible ways of aligning these two sequences. Then you could generate a quality score for each alignment. So a measure of similarity, how close these two sequences are to each other and then pick the alignment with the highest quality score, okay? Uh, and the idea of a quality score is really at the core of the alignment process. So it's the idea that basically you have to create an alignment and then decide is this good or bad or is this better or worse than another alignment. So that's that's the principle. Uh, the point of course of using brute force is definitely not uh, a good way of doing this because even if you have a, a two sequences that are 100 base pair long, the number of potential alignments and most of them don't make any sense are actually uh, astronomical. So in the 1970s, uh, they came up with, uh, um, I would say probably on, on just on paper and with a Blackboard, they, they came up with a, this algorithm, which is basically used today. Um, there are, you know, new implementations of it, but it's actually pretty much the same. If you use any software, you will find that there is an option to use this kind of algorithm or uh, very similar ones. And uh, so Niedermann and Wunsch actually, um, uh, I guess they were mathematicians and they, they found the best uh, solution. So they, they found that the, the basically the algorithm that leads you to the best possible alignments uh, between two sequences given some, uh, um, basically be, be given some um, hypothesis on how uh, a good alignment should look like. Uh, it's also referred to as optimal matching algorithm. Again, same, same approach. It divides a larger problem into smaller problems. It tries to maximize similarity and it goes from the smaller 
problems to the, the final general solution. Uh, and it's it's called um, optimal for global alignments. When you have two, let's say, uh, sequences and you want to try to, to find not all the possible alignments of these subsequences, but the entire, uh, the best solution for the entire uh, two sequences. Uh, it's generally good for high similar sequences and sequence in length, but it's very slow when the sequence grow. But again, it's the, it's the gold standard basically, so it's the best way to go. Uh, it works in a way that anyone can uh, understand. I don't know if we have time for this, but if you go on Wikipedia, there is a, a walkthrough. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very nice exercise. Or now you actually uh, do this from a, a table. So basically if you have two sequences that you want to align, G, C, A, T, G, U, so this one here and this one here, and you want to find the alignment between them, you start to fill it um, in this table with the numbers based on a, a certain set of rules. Uh, and after you've done that, you get the solution. You get the path through the, uh, the table that leads you to the optimal alignment according to um, Needleman and Wunsch. Again, what is really important is that you define the correct uh, set of um, quality um, scores. So let's say if you have a match between two bases, you give it a, a one. If it's a mismatch, minus one, and a gap minus one. Of course, it does depends on the question uh, that you want to answer. Uh, but uh, once you have defined this, the rest is uh, pretty much straightforward. And again, this is something that is embedded in most of the tools uh, that we use uh, even these days. So um, I don't know, here it works very simple. So basically you have to fill this to uh, this row and this column, uh, again, with a certain set of rules, and you decide how uh, this particular um, uh, cell here should look like based on its neighboring cells, okay? Uh, in this case, it makes one because you, you, have, um, uh, you have a G and a G, so it's a match, so one, and the, the closest thing you can come from is zero, so it's zero plus one and makes one, and you do all the, the calculations for all the numbers, and you fill out the table and after that you start from here and say okay so i'm gonna walk the best uh, possible path in here so it's zero one zero one zero two or here there is actually the possibility that two alignments are actually equally good so there is zero to one zero to one equally well and these are actually alignments that the same quality final quality score so i can walk both paths uh, and then you walk here and then you walk here all the way so in the end you end up with three potential alignments that are equally uh, good in terms of a uh, number of matches and mismatches and gaps that you have to introduce in order to obtain uh, uh, the, that particular quality score um, i wanted to introduce this because again this is at the core of uh, uh, of everything or most of what we do, even uh, when you take any assembler, this is basically our uh, underlying, uh, at least some of these steps actually are based on this. Uh, there are actually other approaches uh, to uh, assess similarity between sequences. One of the uh, most uh, fundamental concepts here is the edit distance. So the distance between any two things can be um, measure it as an edit distance or Levenstein distance. So if you take, uh, sorry, this is an Italian word, but if, if you take two, two words that are relatively similar to each other and ask the question, how close or similar to each other they are, that's the edit distance. So how many changes you have to apply to banana to, to convert this into uh, bambina? And it actually turns out to be three changes. So for you first I have to change the M in the end into an M, and then uh, you have to, I think, re substitute, yeah, replace A with B, and then insert an, a, an I. Okay, and it turns out that this is essentially equivalent to the other um, method. The uh, another, I mean, just really to mention it is that the original approach uh, by Newman and Wunsch was actually generalized in 1981 by Smith and Waterman. Uh, with an algorithm that does not only find optimal uh, global alignments, but actually can uh, um, uh, essentially find the best local alignments between two sequences. Uh, I won't go into details on how this actually uh, works, but just to know uh, that it's there. Um, then there are the, let's say, so-called alignment-free approaches where you can still uh, use, which you can still use to find similarity between things. Uh, and for instance, in the case of the genome assembly, this is very important because 
when you have to find the uh, alignments between all the reads in a, in a read set, maybe you want to have a, a heuristic approach that simplifies the problem instead of having to calculate all the possible uh, uh, needle and wunsch aligned between the reads, what you do is actually try to uh, have a more efficient way uh, to actually um, get a subset of reads that go together or and separate stuff that has nothing to do uh, with the other. So these alignment-free approaches have been used to uh, quantify transcripts. Again, they are much, much faster than trying to actually align the reads uh, to, to the reference transcript uh, and uh, can be used for a lot of other things, uh, including, of course, the novel genome assembly, but it's not limited uh, to that. So again, it's worth mentioning that I say most of bioinformatics is, is based on uh, uh, this kind of alignments. The um, let's say the needle and the wound alignments and the, their uh, derived the approaches, but there is also let's say the other uh, side of the coin, which is uh, the uh, so-called alignment-free um, uh, approaches. And of course, uh, much of this actually uh, comes down to uh, K-mers. So I don't know how many people are familiar with the idea of K-mers. What do you think, Matt? <laughs> I'm still using you as a proxy of the group, but. <laughs> uh, pardon, sorry, I, I was uh, distracted by something. I was just, I was just curious to know uh, how many people you think, I mean, how many uh, people in the, in, the, in the group are familiar with the idea of K-mers? Um, so we covered K-mers a little bit when we talked about um, salmon. Um, and mapping your trans direct transcript quantification using salmon. However, that is, we went over it fairly quickly. So, uh, well, I mean, quick as well. Yeah. But the, the idea is again, you, the cameras, first of all, are all these uh, subsequences that you can create of a certain length of a particular sequence. So, imagine that you have a, a read that is very short, ATGTG. Uh, and you want to have all the k-mers uh, that can be generated from that read of length three. So it's going to be ATG, TGT, GTG, and so forth. You have five of them. The nice thing of this approach is that basically you are, well, there, there is only one decision you have to make, which is the word size, how long your k-mer is going to be. And there are a lot, there's a lot of research literature about this, how you actually pick the right, the right number. But once you have picked that number, you're not making any more decisions because basically you explore the entire space all the possible combinations uh, and um, uh, sub uh, sequences or particular sequence and you're done and you that, that's essentially a very uh, inclusive amount of information that you have at your disposal to understand the similarity between two sequences so in this case here which is really a textbook if you have atgtg tg or nca tgtg and you want to ask again how similar these two sequences are so i'm going to dissect them in all the Kamers of uh, length three, which means these five kamers for the first one, the, these four kamers for the other one, and then I'm going to first of all generate the union set of all of all the um, uh, kamers. Okay, so it means that of course some kamers, especially when the the, the, the kamer length is very short, are going to be repeated. So the, the, these are highlighted by the colors here. Now that ATG is present only once in the first sequence, but DGT is present twice and also GTG. Uh, by contrast, this is shorter and more unique if you want. Uh, again, Kimbers can be a very good estimate of uh, uniqueness uh, for a sequence. Uh, and so uh, we, we basically have four different types of sequences here, ATG, TGT, GTG, and CAT. So that's the union set. And then I can ask, okay, how many times the first sequence contains this um, uh, particular Kimbers? And it turns out that the first one is only containing the second sequence, so zero. Then the first, the, the second one, it's uh, present once, uh, two, two, and for the other one is one, one, one. And then you can calculate uh, uh, with a mathematical formula the so-called Euclidean distance between these two sequences. And again, this is a, uh, a metric that you can use to score your sequences. So you can tell that these two sequences have this score. And if you take another sequence, it will uh, and compare with these two, will have its own um, uh, pair uh, score, and you can use that to understand how close uh, that sequence is to those two sequences. And for instance, you can reconstruct a tree. So uh, this is uh, the core of many assembly algorithms. There's the idea of uh, dissecting the reads into their k-mers and then reconstruct the assembly from these k-mers, particularly 
this is um, uh, the idea that comes with the so-called the Brun graphs, um, which are very scary, I think, as a <laughs> concept, but it's not too complicated in principle. Uh, I would say that the assembly world divides between ma two major types of assemblers, those that are based on these uh, the Brun graphs, which are um, strongly using k-mers for assembly, and the um, overlap layout and consensus, OLC uh, approach. Um, both have advantages and disadvantages, but you can see that if you take uh, a long list of uh, short read assemblers that were uh, published over the years, and a, long, and a bit shorter list of long read assemblers that were published uh, more recently, you can see that they tend to all fall in one of the two categories. Even the string graph is basically a variation uh, of the other two. And so basically this is the approach. The greedy approach is basically when you say greedy is, uh, is not good usually, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not even to consider, it's not going to provide you with the optimal solution. So forget about that. The two approaches are the uh, essentially based on the uh, principles of the brain graphs or on the principle of overlay uh, of, uh, of OLC, uh, overlap layout and consensus. Okay, so that's why I wanted to introduce this um, idea of how you generate the alignments because it's important, especially for the OLC and uh, the idea of K-MERS because it's important uh, for the, the brewing graphs. Uh, of course, you need, for instance, to understand which sequences or which reads belong to the same region of the genome. You need some kind of a similarity um, uh, measure that will tell you, okay, these two things belong together. Then you maybe can find a, an optimal alignment between them, but at least you have to separate things that uh, belong together or do not belong together. So that's why the cameras are particularly uh, relevant there. So when it comes to um, these two uh, major, uh, let's say, approaches, uh, of course, there are lots of technicalities here. Here is, uh, and I mean, many of which go well beyond my understanding. You, you really have to uh, be, uh, I mean, you have to be able to design your own uh, assembly tool, which doesn't mean just a, you know, a tool that you use within a pipeline of other tools, but really the core of the assembler uh, uh, to, to be able to understand all this uh, uh, concept. But actually, the overall principle is not uh, too complicated. Uh, so uh, let's say the, uh, well, the main difference between the OLC and the, the Bruin graph is that in the case of the OLC, you're not going to um, count the chemers. You're not going to enumerate the chemers. So basically you take, you have, let's say, um, this sequence here, which is the original assembly that you're trying to reconstruct, and you have generated six reads. Okay, here we're of course in a scenario where there is no read error, there is uh, you know, nothing um, that uh, confounds us. It's a very simple uh, situation. If you have read error rate, uh, sorry, uh, high error rates, particularly for pack bias, et cetera, you have to deal with that uh, and your algorithm are going to become more and more sophisticated. But at its core, the idea is that, okay, I've generated six reads out of this region. And I decide that um, I consider an overlap between them good as long as there is at least five, I think it's five, yes, five base pair of overlap. So it means that I have, a, let's say, read one from A, A, C, T, from so, so for the first read here overlaps com almost completely with read two. And it also overlaps with read three. I think, yes, it also overlaps with read four. But then, yes, there is still some overlap. There are three bases uh, of overlap with read five, but no more than that. So after that, um, uh, there is no more overlap. And we said that we are deciding arbitrarily in this case, as an example, that we are going to use a, a arbitrary cutoff of five base pair. So it means that we consider only the overlaps that are at least of five base pair, which means basically we stop at read four. So you see now we can start to build the so-called assembly graph. We can start to build the assembly graph that says, okay, read one has overlaps with read two for sure. It overlaps with read three and also it overlaps with read four. But again, even if there is in the read space, some overlap with read, between read one and read uh, five, we're not considering it. And of course, here you can have a ton of different 
um, algorithms and sophistication trying to decide which should be the optimal uh, overlap length. Uh, and this is what basically uh, the assemblers are for. And the, there are people working on this uh, uh, their whole lives basically to decide this kind of um, things. But uh, this is the, the core principle. So now they will have linked my reads. And of course, well, we can do the same for the other reads. So read two connects to read three and also to read four and read five and, and so forth. And now we have this graph. And then the question again, which require uh, years of experience to answer is how we walk through this graph to reconstruct the original sequence. Uh, again, this is not a course uh, on assembly algorithms specifically, so I'm not going to uh, dive into that, but that's the, that's the core idea. You, you find the overlaps. Again, you need some kind of a, a guiding principle. It could be also put, potentially based on cameras. I mean, but it's not that, uh, let's say, the overlap layout and consensus algorithms for genome assembly are not using camera at all, but they, it depends on which stages actually you're using them. So you could use it for partitioning them and deciding which one, which goes with which. Uh, and then uh, you find your, the, the overlaps with uh, some of the algorithms uh, to determine the alignment between the reads and the, the quality scores of these alignments. And then you construct a graph. Then you walk the graph of the reads. The Bruin graphs, it's not that different, but instead of uh, having reads, your reads are uh, essentially long gone because you take all the reads and dissect them into their uh, constituent k-mers. Okay, so now instead of having reads, you, these are gone, you have uh, k-mers. And you have connections between k-mers so that you know, for instance, that k-mer one is connected to k-mer two connected to camera three, connected to camera four, and so forth. So you have, you have now a different type of graph, which uh, has nodes as um, uh, the cameras, and the edges that connect the nodes are uh, this connection that you know, of course, from the reads. Now you know that the, there is a, within a read that there was a, you have seen a read that contained camera one and camera two in this sequence. Okay, so then you can use this information, uh, again, to walk the, the Bruin graph in this case, and reconstruct uh, the original uh, sequence. These are two distinct approaches lead to different situations. Um, this one is, uh, uh, I mean, let's say the most important, one of the most important situations where you have a repeat, okay? So here, imagine the red stuff here and here is the repeat and the green and blue and yellow and, and orange is somewhat uh, unique sequence could be relatively unique, uh, completely unique, depends. But the point is that this red stuff here is actually uh, found at least twice, not because it's found here and it's also found here. So we have, basically we have four regions of the genome, green, blue, yellow, and, and orange that are unique. And then you have a red stuff that is shared between these two regions. So if you build the OLC graph out of these, you end up with this situation. So again, nodes here are the reads, okay? You can see them here. So this green read over here, there is a read that is partially uh, overlapping with the repeat. So it's half green and half red. Uh, then there is one here that is red and blue, which is this one. And then there is one that is blue. And then you have yellow, again, all yellow, uh, yellow and red, red and orange, and not only orange. And what you can see here is that then you start to build the connections between the reads and this is an unresolved repeat. So this is a region where the uh, assembler, the algorithm comes later and then looks into the graph and decided which path to take is not able to walk through because it doesn't know if it comes in this way, whether it should go out this way or this way or this way. Okay, that, that's the that's a big problem of genome assembly. That's the whole problem of genome assembly. Uh, and because there is no connective evidence that allows us to walk through the repetitive element. Uh, that's, the, that, that's the whole point. And um, you could see this in the T2T assembly that Olivier was showing before. Basically, you have all these chromosomes and there were some that I was mentioning, the RDNA, where there are five of these repeats, almost identical, different chromosomes, and they're all tangled together because you don't know wh which one is which and how to walk through these uh, uh, repetitive element. Uh, if you look at the Bruin graph, the Bruin graph is, uh, as you can see, um, 
I mean, sort of similar, but different. Uh, and of course, this uh, similarity and difference leads to di very different um, consequences when you have them to use these approaches to assemble a genome. Um, but the idea here is that, of course, you're connecting the k-mers. So now you have dissected your reads into their k-mers, and you only have linkage information between k-mers. So you know that there is this k-mer here and this k-mer here, and they are connected. Uh, so you can still walk through the k-mers up to this point. But then when you get here, there, there is uh, uncertainty as to whether you should um, uh, get to the other side on this side or get to the other side on this side. That's the big problem. And again, and if you take the assembly graph from a different roof and end up here, we have the same problem because you end up in the repeat and you don't know where to get out of it. Okay. So what happens is that here, the assembler is going to break the contiguity. This is where you end up with basically two sequences uh, that are not, um, uh, sorry, you end up four, with four sequences because you're going to end up with breaking it here. So you have only, uh, you have this part and this part, and you break it up here and here. And this is why our assemblies are not uh, chromosome level at this point. Of course, the longest the reads that you have at disposal, the, the, the fewer the problem uh, of this kind you have, because then you start to have a very long read that even, even instead of stopping here, you're just going to walk through the, the repetitive element and connect this region to this region and so you don't have this problem anymore. That's why uh, long reads are so powerful. Uh, the reason why hi-fi reads are so, even more powerful, so if you have to generate a genome assembly today, you want to go for hi-fi reads, even for a little bit small genome size, okay? Even if it's a, a fly genome or something uh, with really small. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, you basically can use these reads uh, that are so accurate to detect even small differences in the repetitive elements, because even if you had here a SNP, okay, just a single SNP in this particular position here would distinguish this repeat from this other repeat, which at this point, this is not a repeat anymore. Okay, it's a very similar sequence, but it's not a repeat anymore. So it means that this whole problem goes away. That's why having long reads, it's good. And if they are accurate enough, to distinguish even small variation within repeats, they will allow you to resolve all the repeats in a genome or most of the repeats uh, in a genome. Questions so far? So what is the best way? <laughs> Nobody knows, of course. <laughs> uh, that, that's the big question. So if you go into the bioinformatics community and ask, well, what is the best way to assemble my genome? They will say, oh, use my algorithm. <laughs> but well, it depends if they are, let's say, uh, more, um, that they're not that arrogant, then we will say, no, no, please use the other tool from that group that is better than mine. But uh, it really depends. Well, I, let's say, first of all, it depends on the question that you have. Uh, but second, it, it, uh, it really, it's hard to say. So the way you should work uh, on this is actually potentially try different assemblers. And then, and this comes to the part of the course that uh, I think is, uh, is more important in, in the end, being able to evaluate the quality of your assembly. So if you have uh, multiple assemblers, you can compare. There are a lot of different metrics that you can measure from of an assembly. And you can then use these metrics to uh, decide which is the, the appropriate assembly. Uh, of course, the, the simplest, but also the best in a way metric is coverage. You now, whenever you have a, a good coverage of a region that looks not too, let's say, not too high, not too low, that's also always a good indication. But again, alignments can fool us. So it depends and not necessarily uh, the case. But I would say that the more, let's say, with the, with, with long read sequencing, the emphasis now is on the quality of the DNA for sequencing. And now with the, again, with long read sequencing and highly accurate reads in particular, the emphasis is on the evaluation of the final result. What you can be sure of is that all these tools have bugs. I will say this is a general principle of bioinformatics. All tools have uh, bugs. Some have many bugs, some have 
have fewer bags, but they all have problems. They will all make, all make a mistake either because the algorithm itself, it's, uh, it's not the best optimal solution to the problem or because they really contain uh, bugs and they are always you know, developed. Um, yeah. So I think we'll refer to the next one. Yeah. This is one of these tools. I, I could walk through this particular tool quickly, but again, I, I would like to know if there are questions of any kind first. I think you can ever is everything is it too simple? Should have been more no. Okay. Well the I okay, so can you, I, I listed many tools. Let me go back to that first. Here, this is not exhaustive, so there are many more tools. Uh, I would say that all core bioinformaticians at some point will try to develop their own algorithm. I haven't because I'm not a core bioinformatician, but uh, the, uh, especially with Illumina, there was a lot of them. Um, again, strengths and weaknesses of each one of them, I don't know them. Uh, it depends on the problem on, this, on, the, on the assembly. Uh, long read sequencing, at this point, it's the, the list is not as long. Um, the, if you have high fi reads, you want to go for high fi asm uh, which is uh, developed by Hangley Group. Hangley also developed the BWA, to give you an idea. Of course, I mean, if you are good at aligning reads, you're probably good at also creating a genome assembly algorithms. Uh, and um, I find ASM is, well, it's competing with Canoe, but it's actually uh, at this point, the state of the art for high fire reads only. And it's extremely fast. Yes. You can assemble human genome in a few hours. So that's that's the that's the big issue of uh, genome assembly. When we mentioned that, sorry, when we mentioned this algorithm from the seventies, we said very slow as the length of sequences grows, but at most precision. That's a big problem of uh, long read uh, genome assembly because if you have very long reads, co computing the overlaps between reads, it's um, um, you know making basically all these calculations takes time for all the reads, all pairwise potential combination, and you can exclude some, but not all of them. So the reason why hi fi -asm is faster than all the other algorithms um, or uh, non hi fi reads is because the hi fi reads have a very high level of error rate. So you have to lower your threshold to decide whether two uh, reads are actually really uh, um, overlapping with, with, uh, between each other. No? Because if you have 10 or 50% error rate within the read, you have to know upfront that there will be a 30% difference between the two reads just because of the sequencing errors. So you have to be able to you know, compute the overlap uh, starting from that error rate. It means that you have to compute many more overlaps. If your reads are much more accurate, which is the case of Illumina, or in the case of high fire reads from PugBio, where you have this uh, circular consensus that took care of removing most of the errors, then what happens is that you don't have to compute all the overlaps. Now, when at some point you get to 2% difference between the two reads, you say, okay, no, I'm not gonna compute any further because uh, these two regions, these two reads belong to two different regions, okay? Because they, they overlap after, let's say, just 2% of errors it's not to be considered a real overlap, but just a, you know, a spurious overlap. So that's why instead of taking days to assemble a genome of a human size, high fi -asm can take uh, a few hour, hours or even less if you have a lot of uh, compute power uh, available. Uh, the other big competitor is uh, Kanua. I'm going to show you in a moment how it works. Uh, this is a nice story because Kanua was actually developed by the NIH in the last I don't know, five, six years. Uh, and uh, it uses the same, it's a, a overlap layer and consensus approach. And it's using the same, um, let's say, approach that was used at the time of Celera. Celera is the company uh, fun, uh, founded, founded by uh, Craig Venter to compete with the uh, public uh, human genome project. Okay. So this is uh, uh, basically the same algorithm that was used to uh, assemble the 
uh, human genome in 2001 by uh, Venter and, and others. Of course, the algorithm has been adapted to the long reads, uh, but it's in principle the same, uh, it's the same thing. Uh, it's hot canoe. Now there is also the version that assembles hi-fi reads. Again, these two tools are competing with each other uh, for the supremacy in the hi-fi world. But again, it's just two years that we are uh, in this situation. But uh, there, there is um, a still competition. Uh, I would say hi fi has been highly uh, extensively tested in humans. But if you have a non-human species, I would say in many cases, hi canoe is actually more accurate. Uh, again, you need to have hi-fi reads to assemble for, for this one. Canoe, by contrast, which is really the same tool, those two different names, it's uh, with different options. It's, it's also going to take care of assembling um, more noisy reads for so the CLR, PugBio reads, or the Nanopore. So you have Nanopore data, hi-fi has them, will not work. Canoe is the way to go because it's a very uh, extensively developed uh, tool uh, and it's the best thing you can do basically to assemble uh, Nanopore reads. Uh, Falcon and Zip is the tool from uh, PugBio itself. I, I wouldn't recommend it, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's still uh, good out there. And there are a few other uh, uh, tools. So the, the principle of, uh, of Canoe, but it's uh, again, the principle of uh, uh, overlap layout and consensus is basically you, well, there, there is an extra step here. So when, even if it's OLC, but if it's uh, uh, long reads uh, uh, from not the hi-fi, so the pack bio CLR reads that are noisy, 10 to 50% error, you still have to correct the reads. So you mean you have to find the overlap with the read between the reads. And once you have identified the overlaps between the reads, you say, oh, okay, so uh, based on this overlap of the reads, I think all these um, uh, errors that's similar to the um, alignment that we were uh, commenting before occur only in a few of these reads are actually errors because they don't occur in all the reads, okay? So I'm going to just remove them. I'm going to turn all the sequences uh, that have these errors. I'm going to remove the error and, and put there the most common uh, sequence that, that I find uh, based on the alignment. Of course, this is an error, pros, uh, an error prone process because you could potentially correct things you shouldn't correct, but at least you end up with corrected reads and corrected reads are then used, well, there is a trimming step where you basically remove uh, uh, some of the things that are at the um, edges of the reads. So you, get, you end up with trimmed reads. And then here is where you basically build the actually the assembly graph and then in your final counting sequences. Again, overlap, layout, and consensus. Overlap, find the overlap between the reads uh, and then lay, create these read layouts, okay, where they, they are all uh, one pilot on top of each other and then walk through the, the read layout uh, to uh, reconstruct the final uh, sequence. Of course, much easier to say than to, to do. You can see that this tool has a, a ton of different steps. Uh, it's highly demanding, so Again, a human genome could take a few days, even on our large cluster. Uh, and that's why uh, basically the entire world of genome assembly is rapidly shifting towards uh, the hi-fi reads because they are much easier uh, to, uh, to assemble. I think we're almost at the end of these uh, three hours. Uh, is there anything you want to add, Olivier, or other questions, comments? No, I mean, to go back to someone said that they tried to assemble a, a bacterial genome. Um, what assembler you recommend to use for bacteria? Hmm. Or any other assemblers will work? Well, that's a good question. So the canoe, uh, which is a po very popular in the genome assembly community, uh, was originally demonstrated in uh, E. coli and uh, it was a very a good showcase for long reads because the uh, resulting assembly was a single a circular assembly. So there was no gap filling required uh, and it was a single counting for, for the E. coli chromosome. Um, so 
I would say at this point with long reads, uh, and particularly with hi-fi reads for uh, organelles and uh, um, microbial uh, chromosomes, any of these assemblers will give you a very good result. But again, it depends. Now you should try. You, there are sometimes there are like uh, parameters to tweak, like for instance, depending on the quality of the data, you should uh, choose a different threshold for to decide whether an overlap should be used or not. So it, it depends. Uh, I, I'm just going to add that that's what we're going to do uh, on Thursday because on Thursday we have we're going to use a Galaxy. How many people have ever used Galaxy or at least know what this is? I don't, you don't. You can Can you raise your hand with the you know, the, the, the function here in Zoom. Oh, it's the metagenomic data, okay. Oh, well, anyway, so the Galaxy, it's a platform. Um, it's actually, it's just a web interface. If you want. It's, I would say this is not a really, um, it's more than a web interface, but it's a web interface that it's um, connecting you uh, to compute power, so it means essentially to HPC uh, uh, around the world. Uh, it's based in uh, uh, in Europe, uh, in Germany, uh, mostly, but there is also a hub uh, in the in the US, and uh, it's giving you access to free compute. So it means that you have a lot of tools that are already installed on the local machines or let's say deployed. Uh, through this uh, Galaxy Cloud to a local machine uh, that is going to then uh, perform the compute for you and is going to uh, provide you with the, uh, with the results, okay? So the way this works is that it's a graphical interface. We don't have to install anything on our computer. Uh, we don't have to uh, create accounts on the cluster. Uh, we're just going to create an account in Galaxy. Um, I'm going to show you in a moment how to do that. Then once you have created your account, you uh, log in, you have some free space. I don't think, I think it's it's free and there is no you know, paid subscription. You can probably negotiate something if you have very large projects, but you, you mostly don't, don't need that. Um, and you get access to a, a whole uh, suite of tools that you can run in terms of manipulating uh, genomic files like FASTA, FASTQ, SAM and BAM and, and so forth. Uh, and uh, you can also generate genome assemblies. You can evaluate those genome assemblies and that's what we're gonna do uh, on Thursday. Uh, I would still encourage you, I'm gonna show you how the, the exercise is, is uh, um, formulated, but so you, you can actually decide to even try yourself before Thursday or we can do it uh, together on Thursday. The reason why I, I, it would be nice if you try it yourself is that uh, as we said, genome assembly takes a uh, time so uh, if you run it, if you're able to run, it should be very simple, it should be very straightforward. So there is a, a Nikolai data set, there is a, a, a East data set, and there is a, a Fly data set, and you can tr try all of them or just one of them. Uh, actually, it's very straightforward. So you, you, you can set it up, forget about it, come back a few hours later and get the result. So if you already have the result by Thursday, that would be good because we can just uh, talk about your results together or if you don't, we, we we're gonna do it together. Probably it's gonna be a mix uh, of both. So the idea here is that, um, again, you, you create an account, we can download the data from NCBI uh, and other sources, and then we can process the data. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna take the row reads, again, for E. coli, yeast, and fly, and use them to generate uh, a genome assembly. We are going to use high fire reads because as we said, it's much faster and also the results is better. But in this case, we're interested in you know, keeping it uh, fast enough that we can uh, evaluate the results together. So we're gonna use the high fire reads uh, to do that. And again, there is nothing else we have to do. Of course, the reason why we're going to use this uh, web interface is because um, if you're not familiar with the command line running these tools yourself, it's, it's, uh, it's more complicated. And actually, the, um, the whole session is going to be 
Okay, about assembly, so we're going to assemble the genome, but that, like I said, at this point, what is more important uh, is to understand what we're dealing with, because running a single tool with a bunch of uh, options and get the results, sometimes it's not that uh, simple, but most of the time is, uh, is not uh, particularly complicated. The problem is, what do we do with that uh, uh, output? Is that good enough? Is that um, uh, contains errors? How do we evaluate assemblies? So that's what we're going to deal with um, on Thursday. And the beauty of Galaxy that is reproducibility. So <laughs> every step you do is recorded with the input outputs and you can really like maintain workflows or, or repeat the same analysis with different data sets. So it's a very beautiful tool for that. Julio, I think on the next slide, there was a link to the exercise. Oh, so yeah, there, there is a, actually there is Galaxy. It's a, it's a community-based um, tool and they have their own tutorials on nearly everything. So if you want to run assembly, that's fine. But if you want to run something different, uh, like uh, you know, RNA-seq analysis, you can actually do that too. Uh, and again, it's free uh, compute, so nothing to um, nothing wrong with that. Uh, there is a tutorial uh, from um, uh, from the Galaxy community, which is this one, okay. And this is again E. coli assembly, but not with HiFi. Uh, this is taking longer. That's why I'm not proposing to. Uh, to uh, to do it, uh, it's actually a, a a hybrid assembly, so it's using Illumina reads and also uh, some mini ion uh, the the device that uh, Olivier showed you before, uh, some nanopore reads uh, for, um, for 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 scaffolding, uh, sorry for 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 closing the gaps. So this is probably answering to some extent the question that uh, your colleague had. I don't know how nasty your particular bacteria uh, was, but this is uh, exactly the same thing. Uh, I would say that HiFi um, overcome many of the issues that you have here. So this need of two different data types and combinations. So that's something to consider, but this works. I mean, this leads you to a very nice assembly. And the good thing about this tutorial is that it goes through every single step in high detail. So all the uh, things I've been talking about, about the assembly algorithms, uh, you handle repeats and all that is taken care and is explained uh, very nicely in this uh, tutorial, much better than I, what I could do. So if you have extra, ex this is not part uh, of, the, of the exercise, but if you have extra time, I would encourage you to try this one because it's, uh, it's, really, it's really nice. Especially if you have a, if you are assembling bacteria and you are having a problem, so maybe this is the uh, is part of the solution. Yeah. So last five minutes. I don't know, Matt. Is there something we should discuss, or I can walk people quickly through these? Uh, no, not particularly. I was just going to also add um, that uh, you set up a Slack for people to, if they need help over the next few days, if they're going to jump on this. Um, and the link is in the homepage for this course. Right. So how do I show this to you? Um, you can just do back. Yeah. Here somewhere? Yeah. Yeah. In the uh, down a little bit install slack there should be a link yeah so if you click uh, so if you once you have an account you click here you get this invitation let's see what happens if i do yeah it, it's trying to open my slack and it's going to add uh, a channel that we created so feel free to use this channel to communicate with us uh, from now to thursday but also beyond that so if you have uh, uh, questions uh, we will try to to help you with that um let me go back here. No. Oops. Where is it? Okay. So the other one thing, the other thing you need to, to do is to create this uh, free account on Galaxy. So if I click here, uh, note that we are using the European version of it. Because the um, they they should the the U.S. version and the European version should mirror each other, but I found that there were some bugs in the uh, U.S. version. I don't know if they now have a, um, a 
fix those bags so that they are identical, but just to make sure that it, you don't get any problem, just use the EU version. So the way Galaxy works is, um, is very simple. Well, in the, in the middle here, you have some announcements, but normally is where you actually have the tool and the, um, say the options. Here on the left, you have the list of the tool and the search box allows you to find any tool that is available on Galaxy. And here you have your history. So the history, uh, you see I have 150 deleted stuff and six hidden. So basically here, whenever you, a job starts or completes, you get a message and uh, you can access the results from, from this uh, uh, page, from, from this column, sorry. And uh, here, let's say I want to, I don't know, trim the FastQ reads, okay? I click here and you see FastQ trimmer. Uh, normally when you have data, you, you will see the data listed here. So you select whatever file you want to um, trim, whatever re read set you want to trim, and then you can, uh, of course, options that you can decide to uh, change or use defaults, and then you click execute. Once you execute it, it's going to get um, uh, cracked in the um, basically the line of the jobs uh, on Galaxy. It's usually quite fast, so you don't have to wait a long time, but it doesn't matter because you actually you can schedule the next job, let's say you first trim the reads for any reason, okay? You want to remove adapters, you trim the reads, and then you want to assemble them. So you, you don't have to wait that the reads are trimmed watching the screen until it's done. You just uh, schedule the second job on top of it, okay? And potentially the third job on top of the, uh, let's say, okay, first trim, then assemble, then evaluate, okay? So you can chain all these things together without having to wait. Um, uh, for any of these to, to even start, okay? So that's uh, that's very helpful. Of course, if you make a mistake in between, it's gonna crash, but that's, uh, uh, again, something you can fix. Uh, but yeah, in principle, we can schedule all the jobs at the same time. And, and, uh, and you also have the possibility to create, I'm gonna show you how to do that next time, workflow. So here you have, a, you can design workflows. This is a, a workflow design that I have where you basically have, you see all the steps and what to do with everything. But we're gonna talk about this uh, next time. Again, if you want to become a very, oops, um, uh, the hardcore bioinformatician, you want to learn the command line, you want to run the command line tools directly if you have access to HPC. But if you don't need that, if you need a um, compute and a very nice interface, this is a very good, uh, solution. We are, for instance, implementing on, on Galaxy our Vertebrate Genomes Project pipeline so that people can use it without having to know the command line. Uh, but again, what you really need to learn is how to evaluate the results so that you don't uh, make uh, mistakes in the interpretation. Uh, so just to create the account, it's uh, here, I think. Well, I'm logged in, so if I log out, I guess we're going to... So I can create a, a new account. You get an email, you get uh, some public uh, name and you get some free space and you're ready to go. So again, if you go on the uh, course website, exercise, there is a step-by-step -step tutorial for our exercise. Again, I will encourage you to try it now, I mean, now, meaning tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, but just before Thursday. Uh, if you fail at some uh, step, uh, just uh, uh, send us a message on Slack and we can help you out. 